So Ricky, uh, Ricky Brabeck is in the studio, fresh off the Dakar win, mate. Second one. Brabeck's ride at Dakar 46 has been remarkable. It's a hard life. It's not, it's not all uh, scoodles and rainbows out there. And then you wake up every day just like, fuck, how many more days? Oh, we're eating what? Oh, the same food we just ate the last seven days. What time we got to get up? 2.45? Motherfucker. The closer you get, the more excited you get. The only thing you're thinking about the second week is, Home. when's that flight? And now I'm like, man, I, I won the Dakar twice. Like, what else is there? Like, what else can we try to go do and try to win? And, you know, what's the next challenge? Dude, no Americans won it three times, so <laughs> why don't we try to go for three? This episode of the podcast is brought to you by AG1. I want to give a big personal thank you for the help in getting me to the start line at Glen Helen for the World Vets. It was a real bucket list thing for me, and I spent all of 2023 training for it. I may have skipped a couple of runs and had a few off days at the track, but one thing I didn't skip all year was a morning started with AG1. Consistency is everything in health and fitness, and one scoop of AG1 with water first thing in the morning, every morning, played a massive role in getting me on the start line. I feel more energized, I have better digestion, and I have a higher sense of general well-being as a result. That's because every scoop includes things such as B vitamins for energy support, probiotics for gut support, and vitamin C and zinc for immune support. And while all of these attributes make AG1 a real no-brainer, you can try it and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash gypsytales. And keep an eye out for our World Vets content dropping here on our YouTube channel soon. I met a gypsy. But um, yeah, I had the Honda thing hit my inbox, inbox and said you're in town. And I was like, done. I got yeah. to hit you up. So it uh, yeah, worked out, worked out pretty sweet. So Ricky, uh, Ricky Brabeck is in the studio, fresh off a Dakar win, mate. Second one. And uh, we spoke about doing this in, what did I see? Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, yeah. yeah. What, what was, what's that desert challenge? Yeah, I think it was last year. Yeah. Abu Dhabi desert challenge at yeah. the awards. Yeah. So and, uh, we said we'd make it happen. And this is probably pretty good timing to do it, really. It's the best timing. <laughs> after, after a win, we're heading to Supercross. We're going to ride the rally bike around the track. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that, are you doing that today? No, no, that's going to be tomorrow, like uh, midtime. Yeah, sick. All right, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome, dude. How do you think the big girl's going to go? Well, I, they're not going to let me jump anything. So, uh, yeah, but last time in 20, I was like, hey, if we do it again, let's uh, let's put some gear on and <laughs> jump the finish line jump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Feld, Feld won't let you. So, yeah, it is what it is. At least we get to ride on the track and have yeah, fun. Yeah. Have, did you ever see the videos of Chucky? um sending the supercross track at his place on yeah oh bro i was there the day that that he was doing it it was i think it was his first ride back from yeah. when he got hurt yeah from fink yeah. yeah and he was just full send bro and yeah like, well but the bike was capable he's crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so how was uh how was the trip when did you get back trip's good um we were in we were in saudi for almost a month like three days shy of a month so uh yeah all was good i got back dude five days ago yeah so been stateside for five days it's been it's been awesome a lot of messages uh, a lot of phone calls yeah like interviews and uh no it's been good i'm happy to be home you know saudi's not close so it was all good uh now we're gonna go to supercross you know we're we're on gypsy tails so we're having a we're having a ball <laughs> that's awesome what's it what's it like for a guy like you to win the Dakar uh, I, you've got a special Dakar story because you're the first American to do it on two wheels and it's not like the biggest race in America comparing it to other you know other countries that support the Dakar I feel like in terms of just the the everyday fan but I feel like you're the guy that has kind of really put the Dakar on the map 
for the US. So I think like you kind of ha- carry the the US spirit on your back in, in a massive way. So like the first time you won compared to this time, like are you seeing more and more following like kind of come your way? Yeah. So, you know, as you said, the, the following for Dakar in US, you know, people know about it, but they don't really pay attention or watch it. And yeah, since we, we won in 20, uh, you know, it, it's been growing. It's been a, it's been, you know, growing and people have been more interested into it. But now that we won again, hopefully, you know, the, the following is going to be that much more and more people want to join. Yeah. I mean, it's not that easy to just go drive down the road and sign up and race. You know, it's a big operation to, to get it to, to happen. So for an American to go there, it's not, you know, efficient. You know, they, they can't yeah. just do it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to win it one time, to be the only American to win it one time, and then to do it a second time, you know, that's freaking, you know, kind of un- unheard of, you know. So hopefully we can keep going and, and get more. And I encourage, you know, Americans to try to get there. It's not easy. It's not cheap, but it's worth every single penny, you know, because you can live, you know, two weeks in the rally is more than what you're going to do here racing in U.S. So yeah. it's it's a big adventure and it's it's a big challenge. Yeah. Just finishing alone is like a win in my book, you know. Oh man, it's it's such a I, I haven't got to follow the the rally personally, um, in terms of being over there, but obviously like going to the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge and, you know, like knowing Toby quite well and Chucky and seeing what they've had to go through over the years, like it's a beast of a race, dude. And and I mean Saudi's no joke too. The dunes that you guys yeah. are going through, like it's a it's a big lift yeah. <laughs> for you guys yeah, yeah. to do what you do. Yeah, I mean it's Dude, it's full of up and downs. You can have a good day, you can have a good day, then you have a bad day, and all of a sudden you're you're dive bombing. You know your your mental state's not right, and then you have a bad day. So then the next day you're like, man, yesterday sucked. Uh, what am I gonna do today to try to get my spirit back up? And hopefully, you know, you have another good day. But if you have one bad day, typically it's gonna snowball to another. You know, not not hopefully as bad of a day but you know you have that in your mind that you know yesterday i did this and i don't want to do that again yeah but then when you're trying to race to make your day so positive it's still in back of your mind and the next thing you know yeah you make a mistake that mistake leads to another mistake and then it just you know snowball effect so it's a lot of up and downs and if you can maintain you know Mm. a happy medium yeah then you're gonna ride and navigate and just be in a better mood the whole time. And, you know, that's the thing with rally. That's hard. It's mentally kind of frustrating, you know, because yeah. you have a bad day and then you're like, fuck man. And you can lose, you're losing like minutes, 10 minutes, 20. It's not like a, you know, a two second, you're two seconds off in qualifying. Like sometimes you're losing like chunks of time and yeah. it'd be hard to see like, how would I make that back? Ex- exactly. And that's where like the mental side of it is really hard. Cause like you said, you, you miss one corner, it's not like falling over in supercross and losing, you know, five to ten seconds. It's like you miss one corner, you're losing five to ten minutes. Yeah. And then next thing you know, now you're thinking, how am I gonna make that time back up? Like today's not gonna be the day to make that time up. So tomorrow's gonna be that time. And then next thing you know, tomorrow, what happened the day before is still in your head. Yeah. So you don't want to make a mistake, but then now you make another mistake and there's another five minutes. So it's it's mentally you know exhausting and to to have a level head and make sure that you're on top of your game you know you don't want to be on a high i mean yeah you want to be on a high every day but if you're too much on a high yeah you know, a little mistake is gonna dive bomb you quick so it, it's frustrating i mean no one does a perfect rally everyone makes mistakes yeah. you know i've this is nine years for me and i still make mistakes and toby 10 years yeah he still makes mistakes and it's like it's just it's part of the the game yeah how fast can you you know fix your mistake is actually the 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 most professional way yeah so yeah and and knowing that you can't push every day i think as well or like that i'm sure you guys could go faster than what you're actually going at times too yeah but it's like you've got to be you got to be really chill. level and really you're know, like no one to hold them, no one to fold them kind of thing, because 
you're just you're so out there i mean sam went out with the mechanical this year like you've had your you know rallies where you know you've gone out so it's like you, you're playing this balancing act between like pushing and 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 chilling uh, and you know it it does not come easy out there 100 percent. you know you have to the hardest part like you said is like yeah we can go faster but some days you know we don't want to go faster you know we have <laughs> yeah. to play the game you know some some days we're you know like you said we're going slower to be set up for the following day and some days we're pushing 100 percent because the next day they say is easier but i mean dude in the rally they say, oh, tomorrow's easy, you know, less navigation, but that's like the day everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, like, they'll say, it, we have a description, you know, of each rally. Like, on top, it says, like, you know, like, 20% asphalt, 5% sand, 19% rocks, you know, and so on. And then you go on the stage, and it's freaking, like, 95% rocks. So, it's like their description's a little bit off. A little bit. But you still try to focus on, you know, the following day from what they said, you know, and that's how you set yourself up. Yeah. And, you know, it's not easy. You're trying to set yourself up, but next thing you know, you miss something. And then now you're not where you want to be. So it's, it's, it's up and down yeah. constantly. Yeah. So let's, let's go back a little bit then to, a, I guess, a bit of your story to get to Dakar. Like you said, you've done it nine times. You've won it twice. You've got second. So you're very accomplished in, in the sport, but being an American, and doing Dakar, there's it, there's not a huge history of guys that have come before you. So how do you even get to the place where you do your first Dakar as an American? So, yeah, that's, um, you know, I got a phone call from Quinn, Quinn Cody. And, you know, he was an, an American that did Dakar, you know, kind of more in my era of, of knowing what Dakar was. You know, I was in high school, Quinn was racing Dakar and, you know, Robbie was racing Dakar and I was like, okay, as an American, we're going to, you know, focus on these guys. So I was racing national Heron hounds, um, you know, grand prix, Baja best in the desert, yeah. you know, winning championships. And one day like Quinn calls me, Hey, what do you, what do you think about rally? And I was like, kind of in shock. Like, what do you mean? What do, what do I think about rally? Like I watch it. Yeah. I don't know anything about it, but I watch it. Asked if I was interested, if I wanted to do like, you know, two days of training and go to my first event, which was Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge huh. in 2015. Yeah. Quinn takes me out. Dude, I make every mistake you can make because I don't know what I'm doing. He just, here's a road book. I'm going to follow you. Let's go. I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, <laughs> no way. I'm like, I, where do we start? It's right there on your road book. And I'm like, yeah, I understand, but. I don't know anything about this. Oh, you'll figure it out. And I'm like, nice. Okay. <laughs> dude, it took, I swear, dude, like eight hours to do, you know, 80 miles. No like, way. I was so lost, dude, missing everything. And uh, that's how that's how it started for me. Yeah. Because Quinn had a contact from Honda at the time, which was interested in me and, you know, that's how I got to my first rally. So after my first rally, I think I got like fifth in the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. Then they're like really stoked. They asked me to go to another rally, which was, um, I believe it was Ruta 40 in Argentina the same year. Yeah. Did that one, made, you know, massive mistake. I missed a waypoint, you know, blew a lot of corners. And then uh, after that, they asked, hey, you want to go to Dakar? They gave me a contract for Dakar. My first Dakar was uh, 2016. I got ninth overall. After that, hey, we'll talk in a couple weeks. Okay. A couple weeks go by, you know, they, they offer me another deal for the year, for the next Dakar. So I took that, and that's kind of how, you know, it snowball effect all the way to where I'm at now. And, yeah, we won. In 2020, we got close in 2019. 21 was second. 22, I don't know, we had a mistake. 23, crashed out. And then, uh, yeah, here we are, 24, we won again. So I think I got uh, more or less lucky. I was like, I was at the right place. Yeah, right place, right time. Exactly. But you'd done the right work leading up to it to be prepared for when the opportunity came kind of thing. Yeah, so 
after my first Dakar, I was like, man, that was crazy. I was not prepared for it. Get home, get another contract. And then I'm like, I don't even know what to do. Johnny Campbell reaches out to me. Then now I'm on JCR for American yep. stateside racing. Johnny links me up with Jimmy Lewis, which is a like a motorcycle trainer in Pahrump, Nevada. Also did the Dakar back, you know, in the 90s. So then now I'm just spending, you know, all my time in Pahrump, Nevada, dude. There's nothing there. <laughs> and it's either hot or cold, like really cold yeah. or really hot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Pahrump, Nevada, you know, learning road books, learning the tricks, learning the game, uh, learning how to do all this while you're frustrated. And that's the hardest part is mm. when you're frustrated, you still have to keep keep your cool, you know. And when you're racing, you know, in America, you get frustrated. Normally, you're just, all right, full gas. Yeah. I'm pissed off. Uh, yeah. I'm going to do what I do and just move people just out of my way. Just smash through everything. Yeah. 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 But in rally, dude, you do that back to your 10 minute mistake you know and next thing you know oh you're breaking a femur and you're in a hospital in argentina exactly (laughs) yeah so that's that's the hard part is like when you're frustrated like cool your head down you know keep calm and try to focus on what you're doing right now don't get frustrated you know of a mistake you made you know get past it and that's the hard part so through my career you know jimmy likes to jack with me and make me frustrated just so I can go training frustrated. Mm. And it's, it's been a roller coaster, dude. It's, it's not easy. I mean, from social media, of course it looks easy. You follow me or you follow. Yeah. You just look like a base that's killing it. <laughs> yeah. You follow me, you follow Toby, you know, you, all these guys aren't doing anything. I mean, for sure. You follow Toby. That guy's just shooting guns, driving trucks. And yeah. like, like, man, this guy doesn't do nothing, <laughs> Yeah, but he goes out there and smokes us. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's it's a hard life. It's not it's not all uh, skittles and rainbows out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I feel like Nevada's probably a pretty good state to live in to train for this shit. Like, if you've got someone that can build your road books, and then you can go out there. Like, if you've got someone really knowledgeable that can build proper hard road books for you, like you kind of have the terrain, and you've kind of got like I'm guessing just endless shit that yep. you can ride through. So. There's not a lot of Americans that have done the Dakar and been as successful as you, but there actually probably is some pretty awesome training here for it. The, this is the ultimate training grounds. Yeah, we have like a lot of fences and, and military stuff, but you link up with someone like Jimmy that is in with, you know, this the, I don't know, the, the BLM, and he knows what trails are legal, what trails are not legal, what, where there's fences and whatnot. So Jimmy builds books, you know, that are capable for rally. Mm. And a lot of people ask me like, well, how do I get into it? So if you get into it, you know, you need a bike with a big tank (laughs) and you, you can get into it by having an iPad and the app called rally blitz. And you just put it on your handlebars and you're good to go. But the biggest issue is like you just mentioned, where do you get a road book? Yeah. So now you're stuck. Yeah, I have all the equipment, but you 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 don't just go download a road book. You know, you have to find someone. Yeah. So Jimmy has like the ultimate stash of road books, and you know that's why we go there to train because he has the road books. But uh, that's you know this is the best desert for it. It's not Saudi's not smooth. You know Saudi's not South America. Yeah. Saudi's more or less like the Mojave Desert here yeah, in Nevada. So super rocky and like yeah, the rugged. Yeah, like the sandy, rocky cliffs. Yeah. And where you would start is get your bike set up and call Jimmy cuz he has yeah. he has the key, you know. He's got the source. Yeah. And that's how you should start. And yeah. then there's a rally in uh mainland Mexico called Sonora Rally, which is the most affordable rally yeah. for us Americans cuz we could drive there. And it's a friendly, fun rally. Not super difficult, but you definitely get your feet wet. Mm. And you can figure out there, like, if it's something you want to pursue or something you don't want to pursue. So, you know, between Nevada and mainland Mexico, Sonora, you can figure out, you know, if you want to actually do it or not at a reasonable price. Yeah. So... Have you seen a big 
like I guess uptick in people doing rally since 2020 and since you had the win? I've had a bunch of people like reach out to me, basically asking the questions that I just answered, like how yeah. would you would get into it? But um, as far as like my my you know naked eye seeing it actually happen, uh, not too much. I mean, I'm sure they're trying to do it, but I mean. I don't go training with these people because they don't ask me to go training with them, but yeah. <laughs> I maybe, and hopefully now that, you know, we won twice, they, they get a grip on it and actually try to do it. And I, I encourage all of them to do it. You know, like it's fun. You can, you can go ride dirt roads or sand washes and you have a lot of fun. Cause you're always thinking, you know, you're like, yeah. you're focused on where you're trying to go also trying to dodge all these rocks and you know animals or whatnot but it, it's all fun because it's part of the adventure and yeah if someone wants to go training dude give them a road book all right well i do what quinn and jimmy does to me like here you go yeah yeah where do i start it's right there uh, right, read. <laughs> page one brother yeah page one <laughs> get to it but no it's all fun um i really enjoy you know rally i enjoy riding enduro and and moto but my my forte is you know the adventure across the desert so that's why i choose to do rally and hopefully like i said it encourages other people to go take the adventure and take the task and see where it ends up so where, where did bikes start for you was it a family thing yeah so um it's funny because i i grew up in hesperia and there's like the, a small little area where you can ride it's not really legal to ride but we do it anyways and it's called honda valley yeah well everyone calls it honda valley so that's what it's known as but uh i grew up there and i was able to ride for my house but i i grew up racing bmx and then riding was just something like you said you know me and the family and their friends at the time i was dude eight years old so whatever didn't have that many you know grown-up friends but yeah, we'd go camping, dude, Glamis. We'd go to Lucerne. We'd go to Ridgecrest um, a couple times a year, weekend warrior style. But my, my focus as a kid was BMX racing. And then uh, once, you know, that kind of vanished, I tried my first motorcycle race, I think, in 2006 or seven. How old would you have been then? I think in uh, 2006, my first race, I was probably 15. So you got a pretty late start to it then. Yeah, but yeah, so but you obviously build like a great foundation with BMX. Yeah, and you know, racing BMX all my childhood years and riding, you know, like you said, the foundation was was nice, you know, it was there. But when I tried my and I rode, you know, motocross when I was younger, I was like my sixty five, my eighty five, and my two fifty F. But then once we met this one family in Arizona at my parents' river spot, they were like, "Oh, let's go camping." It was a race, signed up for my first desert race. And ever since then, I was like, dude, that was freaking badass. That was fun. And I ha I enjoyed it. So from there, that's kind of when I pursued, dad, this is what I want to do. I want to go race desert. And dude, it all just kept snowballing. Next thing you know, well, like five years later, got a call to race in Mexico. I took that just to see, you know, just to expand my my career at the time. Did that. Next thing you know, I'm racing best in the desert. And then now, you know, the older I was getting, 20, 21, I'm racing a score championship. I'm racing best in the desert championship. And I'm racing a national hare and hound championship. And then like 25, uh, 24 is when I get my rally call. Yeah. So then I kind of, you know, leave best in the desert. I leave. Uh, score a little bit and I leave Heron Hound slowly and then I'm, I'm trying to focus on rally so that was like my transition basically from you know 15 years old to where I'm at now yeah and now I'm like man I've, I've won the Dakar twice like what what else is there like what else can we try to go do and try to win and you know what's the next challenge but I mean the next challenge dude no Americans won it three times so yeah. <laughs> why don't we try to yeah. go for three yeah yeah yeah, I mean, you're just like kind of in a 
in a league of your own in a sense like you're the only american to win it and you're the only american to win it twice and if you win it three like you're kind of just building a pretty crazy legacy of you know like the it, it can be done oh man for sure and just the to be done at a super super high level you yeah. know like it's really hard to win more than two as well like two is a pretty crazy number like toby's on two uh we were talking about this at the finish line dude we we're like all right what do we do next we all have we all have two wins yeah 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 we're like ah i don't know man yeah well i, I mean w- i wonder if toby's gonna go again did he say if he was gonna go again i think, I he's, I think he's kind of on the fence about it all right dude it's toby <laughs> you never know you never know what this yeah. guy's doing you follow him on instagram you don't know what he's doing but he he might i mean he has it yeah so i don't know no one knows what he i don't even think toby knows what he's doing that's fair but yeah like so sunderland's got two there's, kevin yeah 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 kevin's got two so yeah all of you guys are kind of in a group of right now the the group is yeah. all tied yeah so we i and we're all the same age yeah true way eh? so, very similar in age all you guys yeah so now we're all like man we can't just leave yeah Heck, someone's got a break, you know, the twos, so I don't know. It's it's tough, but I don't know what's going to happen. And obviously, all of us have two. You know, yeah, we all won three. Yeah. But, dude, just, like like we said earlier, just a finish is, is a win, let alone to win one time and then win two times. Now we're all, you know, in the same boat. Like, okay, well, can there be a third time? But dude, it's not easy. Mm. So, who knows what what the future holds? But I think, yeah, we could do three. Yeah, three feet, baby. <laughs> yeah, three feet. We could do it until you have one bad day. Then you're just dude kicking yourself in the ass, and now you're mad. And next thing you know, you're thirty minutes behind. Yeah, it, there's a cool camaraderie as well between all of you guys. And I think that like, I mean, maybe maybe it's worth explaining actually just doing like a high level explanation of Dakar to any American listeners that don't really follow it because it's a crazy setup with the bivouacs that they build and the the uh what do they call them like the um the drives to the stages the liaisons yeah the liaisons to the stages like I mean you guys are up at 3 a.m in the morning pretty much every day like so what what's like a high level Dakar explanation to someone before we like really get into the details of it uh, that it's uh, dude like you said it's we're up at three in the morning and you know the first week is always easier than the second week because between those two weeks you have a rest day like i i don't i think it'd be cool without a rest day because a rest day for me is like a wasted day and you kind of your body starts like you know on a rest day your body's going downhill you know you're mm-hmm. you're, you're resting so you're, you're body- noticing how fucked up you are yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so the first week's always easiest because you know the food is the food, whatever, you know, the liaisons, the stages, and then the finish liaison. And then you get back to the bivouac. You're super stoked. Then you have the rest day kind of kicks you in the ass. Then the, then you go back, you know, on stage seven and then you wake up every day. Just like, fuck, how many more days? Uh, we're eating what? Uh, the same food we just ate the last seven days. <laughs> and you're like, fuck. All right. What time we got to get up? 245 motherfucker so it's like it gets harder and harder you know the second week every day because oh, because the closer you get you know the more excited you get but also your body is freaking going downhill quick and then the only thing you're thinking about the second week is home warm bed. when's that flight you <laughs> barbecue know? yeah yeah what day am i leaving uh oh, can i leave earlier <laughs> so the second week's definitely tough but yeah you know we wake up three in the morning we we try to eat breakfast, but it's so damn early, and you're tired. You don't have a choice. You have to eat. So next thing you know, you're just shoving food in your mouth, and now you don't feel so hot. You're riding down this liaison. Dude, we had one one day liaison was 500 k's. <laughs> yeah, that's so gnarly. Yeah. I'm like, just to get to the start line of the stage. 500 k liaison, a hundred kilometer special, and then. I think a 90 kilometer liaison. So dude, it was a long time in the saddle on the highway. Mm. This, I don't agree with, you know, I'd rather just drive to the start, unload race. Yeah. But that's not the Dakar. 
yeah, yeah. You know, they want you to freaking struggle. So, yeah, we're waking up early. We're riding all morning in the dark. As soon as the sun comes up, we're starting the special. After the special, you're already smoked. Now you got to ride the liaison again to the bivouac. And now you get to the bivouac 3, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock p.m. Dude, long days. And then you get back to the bivouac starving. Obviously, you're not eating while you're racing. So you're trying to eat lunch at 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And the next thing you know, you got to wake up again the next day at 3 o'clock in the morning. So now you're eating lunch at 4. Lights out at 8 p.m. So now you're trying to eat lunch at four and dinner at seven. So mm. now you're freaking just cramming in. Yeah, cramming in the food, and you're not even eating enough food or calories or carbs to like replenish your your body. And it's it like I said, the first week's easy. You're stoked. The second week, you're like, all right, same food, same breakfast. You know, earlier mornings, and then all you're thinking about is home. Yeah. And yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I I, th- I think you you get races where it's like physically gnarly but mentally it's more gnarly in a sense but then you get somewhere it's like it's mentally not that gnarly you've just physically got to smash your way through whereas dakar just fully rinses you on every front yeah it just kills your body it kills your mind it kills your soul and it's kind of designed (laughs) to be that way in a sense it's like it's almost like the tour de france of of with an engine yeah, where it's just designed to make you suffer, and it's the dude that can deal with the most amount of shit is probably the guy that's gonna win. Yeah, exactly. They 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 don't want they don't want you to finish, <laughs> and yeah. they they design yeah. it that way. And like this year, the first three days was gnarly, and everyone was saying, "Hey, the first three days is survival. They want to knock you out, you know, the first three days, so that way, you know." Don't waste our time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the first three days was freaking gnarly, dude. And in, in what sense? Rocks. Yeah. Rocks, trick navigation. I mean, dude, it's four notes a kilometer. So, I mean, you've a kilometer, dude, is nothing. Yeah, yeah. But when you're trying to race. That's every 250 meters you get in a note. Yeah. And now, dude, you're trying to race. Look, you're, you're racing, dude. You're like this. You're not even looking right there. You're just riding like this because it's so it's so quick. Yeah. And uh they it's the Dakar, you know, they don't want you to just have a breeze and check out the scenery. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another thing at the end of the stage. Oh, what'd you think of the scenery? It's like motherfucker, <laughs> we're reading this road book and trying not to hit all the rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't see it. Yeah. Well, I'll go home and watch on TV. How about that? <laughs> yeah, send me some pictures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh yeah. So Saudi's crazy though, right? Like the the actual like I remember talking to Skyla about the Saudi Dakar last year and he was just saying it was breathtaking like so much different to what people would think that Saudi would be like obviously you've got the dunes which I think is what most people think attribute to a country like Saudi Arabia but it's actually wild the type of landscape that they have there the landscapes are are pretty insane like the walls like the in Hayal and Alula, the the walls in the canyons are so tall, dude. You're riding through these canyons, and okay, whatever. You can look. <laughs> I mean, if you're going down this canyon, you know you're going a couple k's down the canyon, but you just see the walls, dude. Insane, and like especially when the helicopter is like flying towards you through the canyons. Really, God, it's so sick. But the dunes are the dunes. I mean, all that could be anywhere. Yeah. That could be anywhere. They're big or they're small, whatever. But yeah, when you get into the landscapes, dude, like these walls are so tall, but there's like moss growing out of them. So it's like the, it's like black rock or like dark brown rock, but then like with green growing out of it and tall and like there's wild formations, you know, like there's a little stem like this with a big old fat rock, like a balancing rock. It's like, dude, how is that even possible? But no, it, it's, it's insane. I think it's the best country for this. Really? Yeah. Just yeah for the footage. It's it's unbelievable it's it's nice yeah well, i um i was well we we spent a few months of the year in dubai and i fucking fully rated it eh? like I, I mean i i think people have such a especially for america i think they got like a very different perspective of of what it's like but dude those countries in the middle east are so much fun like the food's amazing the people are 
the hotels. people are so nice. Like, yeah, the hotels are, are crazy good. But I, I haven't been into Saudi, but from everything I've seen, it looks unreal. Yeah. Well, Saudi, like Jeddah, Riyadh, like the, the two main cities. And like you said, like Dubai, like the the building and like the landscapes, you know, the way they build things, dude, is insane. It's not like here in America. We're just, yeah. we're building boxes on top of boxes and over there every building has like some wild feature like dude it's sick i think it's cool yeah and do you, do you get like do you enjoy that the food and stuff like that over there as well do you get into it or are you pretty american when it comes to the food no i i, I when i travel i try to eat you know yeah sweet, okay. what, what they eat you know yeah. just dude american food you can get that anywhere yeah so yeah when we're there we we try to eat you know what the culture has and is I like it. Yeah. Like you said, Dubai, dude, the food's good. Saudi's the same. Yeah. It's it's good. Their grocery stores are insane. Crazy, right? Yeah. Like that, you could find anything there. Yeah. Like at a good quality. Yeah. That's the one thing that when my like when my wife came over for the first time, she was so skeptical about the whole thing, eh? <laughs> and dude, the you know the have you been into like the uh the Dubai Mall? Like the main one that they got there. There's they've got one supermarket in the Dubai Mall that's like one of the most insane things I've ever seen in my life. Like just every country basically has its own like produce grocery. Yeah. So and like she's Russian, so there's like this whole Russian section with like every single kind of <laughs> Russian cheese, pickles, like just the the fish, the whole deal. And it's actually mind blowing. Yeah. The uh yeah the level of like the food that they've got there like it's so insanely multicultural as well so it's a pretty pretty epic place to be I'm, i think it's cool that you like the rally from that standpoint as well yeah no and and i feel safe like yeah dude in alula the first day of the, of the rally we're cruising down this road we're like dude two three kilometers past where they had like turrets on side of the road missiles dude pointing into the sky and i'm like dude toby you see freaking they're ready to go to war here dude like we're i don't know if we're safe or if we should be sketched out we're racing through like bomb land yeah does this mean we're super safe or super unsafe yeah (laughs) yeah and man we were they had like six missile launchers dude just pointing straight into the sky and i'm like man that's freaking gnarly (laughs) that's something you don't see here yeah but uh no the rally the food the the stores like the mall you said i haven't been to the dubai mall but i've been to uh in abu dhabi they have like the ferrari yeah yeah ferrari world yeah on yaz island there oh i know that mall you're talking about that one's sick too it's it's pretty pretty wild dude the malls here lame (laughs) (laughs) in comparison yeah so um, so your rally in particular, uh, how did it start off? Like, how are you feeling coming into it? What, did you have like a, a good run coming into this one? No injuries, like a good bike setup, like bike development. So, uh, yeah, this year we had, you know, a new bike, new chassis and, oh, you guys rode the new brand new sick. Yeah. So we spent all last year developing the bike and, you know, set up and, Developing a new bike's not easy. I mean, yeah, you can go buy a bike if you ride a Honda, you know, your whole life, and then you go buy a, whatever, you go buy a KTM. It's not easy to set that bike up if you've been on, you know, Honda your whole life. So it's more or less like the same thing. Ask Jay Sexton. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, we have a new bike. Uh, Spent all year, dude, back and forth, up and down, dude, getting this thing to work. And, yeah, before the Dakar, I did some training with Skyler. Dude had a big crash in uh, oh, in Nevada. That was massive, dude. Yeah, I had a big crash, and I'm like, man, that that hurt. Really? And then yeah. now I'm like, okay, the bike. I broke the bike, and now going into Dakar, I'm like, kind of scratching my head, like, damn, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. So were you hurt out of it, or? Yeah, dude, I dude busted my face, busted my hand, I busted i got some scratches whatever but most of all like the bike was hammered yeah and uh was that your race bike that you were planning on racing or no it was it was was a brand new 
model bike but my training bike yeah okay so smash that thing up pretty good and then uh going into dakar you know i had mixed feelings because i was like man the old bike for sure wouldn't have done this to me mm. so it, it was just like a learning process of yep. trying to figure out how to ride the new bike yep. versus the old bike yeah what's so, the new bike based on um it's based out of a i think like an x or an rx chassis yeah okay and uh yeah it's obviously a little bit more rigid so there's things we had to work on but yeah going into the rally i was mixed feelings prologue comes around we do some shakedown it's good prologue comes around make a little mistake of prologue and now i'm like kicking myself in the ass you know before the race even starts because now i'm like dude day one i did a shit prologue now i'm gonna have to start in the front and i'm gonna lose time today blah blah but in the end everyone made almost the same mistakes so the times were still close yeah so i got lucky so did you you qualified way further up than you wanted to basically or how did it work so in the in the prologue the rally gp guys like however many there are there could be 20 or 17 or 15 those guys can pick you know their starting order mm. but obviously if you qualify first you're gonna be the last person to pick your spot and have you know the most opportunity well, I think I was like 11th. So I'm like, damn, I'm, you know, and, and typically when it's the rally GPs uh, that can pick, it's typically the way they pick is going to be the reversed order of mm. the, the finished prologue. So now I'm thinking in my head, like, damn, I got 11th. I'm going to start freaking way up front tomorrow. And all these guys are going to start behind me. And that's going to follow to our tracks. Yeah. So now, you know, now I'm the guy being hunted mm. on day one. So day one, <clears throat> big stressful day. You know, day one was a big day, rocks. I, it, you know, the rocks, I enjoy the rocks. I, I can ride the rocks. I grew up here. Yeah. So like you said, with the with the desert and the terrain, it's, it's rugged. This is where I grew up, so I feel comfortable in it. Day one turned out good. I got, you know, second on the day. So from day one, <clears throat> I was like already kind of on a high, like, okay, I did good today. Tomorrow, I start second. The guys are still starting behind me. Mm. But now I'm like, okay, I started second. So I didn't lose time yesterday. And I'm going to gain bonus time on day two because I'm starting up front. Yeah. yeah. So then on day two, dude, me, Nacho, and Ross open up the whole day. We all get bonus time because we're so close to each other. So then... After day two, I think all of us finished, you know, like three, four, and five. So day two was another high. You know, I'm like, man. We're crushing. <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah, we're doing good. Like, how come no one's, like, putting these 10-minute gaps to us? Yeah. Day three, fuck, here we go again. Like, they're all hunting us down. Day three comes around. Okay, we get three, four, five again, or more or less like that, right in the middle. Us three were basically positioned perfectly every day we were right in the middle of you know the ktm gas gas and husky you know every day so what we did on on day one i think set yeah. the mood for the rest of the rally yeah which is crazy to think right yeah and I, this is what i'm this is what i would, was talking about to the team i'm like i don't know how this is working out like this because i'm always we're always starting in front of these guys like when when are they gonna make the massive push and put 15 minutes to us mm. and this is the hard part is you know we're now we're thinking fuck what are they gonna do when it when when is gonna be the the breakaway day when are they gonna put massive time on us and just leave us in the dust but that day never came mm. so i think from stage one we did like a good show and i think it placed us perfectly on day two which would have placed us perfectly for three and so on all yeah. the way to the finish yeah and then now we get to rest day i just take the overall lead on rest day like the day before rest day by one second and now i'm like fuck dude one second gap like this is the most stressful race i've ever done what, what am i going to do one second is it's nothing literally nothing we're, we're starting the rally on day seven now 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now. Yeah, the whole first week is a wash. Yeah. And now we're starting the second week tired, closer to being home, thinking about the flight, thinking about the barbecue, you know, thinking about <laughs> holidays. Yeah. And now I'm like, fuck, man, we're so close. It's it's like we're starting a new rally, but we've been working our ass off the last six days. So I had it, you know, I had an idea of what I was going to do when I was going to do it. So the day after rest day, I played a little bit of games. I, I caught Ross, which was the guy that was in second, one second behind me. So I caught him. So now in my head, I'm like, okay, I made three minutes on him. I'm going to sit with him all day. So I got him. Dude, he was like, all right, you know, go go open up. I'm going to sit behind you. And I was like, okay, whatever. I do half the stage with him just sitting behind me. We are getting closer to the finish, and I just kind of like pull over. You know, go, Ross. I'm going to follow you in. And I just followed Ross in but sat way back in the dust and kind of went, you know, like 50%. Yeah. Which placed me and Ross perfectly for the following day. But Ross started right behind me, so I made up three minutes on Ross. And then the next day, he could make up three minutes on me, leaving the gap to be one second. So I'm like, fuck, all right. The next day, I don't have a choice. Like, I have to yeah. get on it. The next day, I think eight, dude, I was 110% on the gas. Caught up to Toby. Me and Toby rode together. I lost my rear brakes. Uh, hit, like, my caliper on a rock, and it was warped, so it just made the thing super hot. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, Toby, I don't got rear brakes. So if you want to, like, if you can ride faster in front of me, then go for it. And he's like, no, mate, I can't even keep up with you with rear brakes. <laughs> but I, in my head, I had like a vision of how I was going to do this day. Like I, Ross already behind me. And obviously I didn't want him to catch me to make up three minutes on me because I had already had yep. that gap. So yep. I was like, okay, I'm going to freaking, I'm going to juice it all day, dude. I made like a seven minute gap to Ross. So now that put my lead up. And they're asking me, oh, are you a little bit more uh, relaxed now that your lead is uh, this? And I'm like, no, dude, seven minutes is nothing because yeah. you blow one corner, it's 10 minutes. Yeah. So now it's even more stressful because now the next day I'm starting 12 minutes ahead of Ross. So now Ross has another advantage to make up on me. So uh, second week was so stressful. And then – uh Cards didn't work out how I wanted to. So in stage 11, uh, Ross, I was in my mind, I was thinking stage 10, Ross is going to beat me and open up stage 11 and I'll have another opportunity to make up minutes on Ross, but didn't work out that way. Ross finished, I think like eighth on stage 10 and I was first mm. and our gap was like seven minutes at this point, but Ross started 18 minutes behind me. So now I'm opening up the road and now I'm worried that Ross is going to catch me 18 minutes and it was a big stressful day, but stage 11, no one caught me. I nailed it, rode slow and just nailed the navigation. And I ended up, uh, at the last refueling, I, I heard I was winning the stage by like 40 seconds and I was like, fuck, I don't want this. You know, I don't want to open the last day. Mm. So the last, you know, couple of kilometers, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go 50% back or down then Ross ended up beating me by like 20 seconds. So it, it's all a game, dude. And mm. the the minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes is nothing because if I start first and you start third, you can make six minutes on me. And if I only have a seven minute lead, then that leads out the window. Yeah. And the, the three days after rest day of like one second, dude, to three minutes, it's nothing. It, it was the most stressful thing, dude. I've, most stressful race I've ever done in my life because I'm like every day you're thinking about how can you bridge the gap? How can you push? But you push, then you risk making a mistake and then losing all the time that you're trying to gain. And it's, it was a headache. And so how did those last few days play out for you? The last few days was <laughs> stage 11. I had to open Ross was 18 minutes behind me. So I was really stressing. And this is where the frustrating rally training comes in play, you know, because, yeah, you're frustrated or you have mixed feelings about how the day's going to go and the time you're going to lose. But I just tried my best, like, to keep my cool. And I tried not to let it bother me. 
but uh no it worked out it worked out really well and then um on 12 stage 12 it was the last day i started behind ross so what i did on 12 was i just sat behind ross the whole day because i hadn't you know obviously I, I needed the bike to get to the finish line but ross was fighting for second place and my teammate was fighting you know to get second or third so ross had a big job you know because ross didn't want to lose second but the last few days was uh was stressful and after stage 11 you know i i opened the whole stage and i was pretty confident like okay like we sealed the deal but there's still one more day of racing so like the emotions on stage 11 were like meant more to me than the finish of the actual rally mm. because that was like that's where it could really go wrong yeah and i was like stage 11 was a day where we were gonna lose or we were gonna maintain and we maintained it so the last three days was stressful because we opened up stage 10 i caught my teammate on stage 10 i started second he started first we rode together but also ross had a big advantage to catch us so we worked together on 10 and then we were we tried to work together on 11 but no one caught me so it was stressful but i still had like the comfort knowing my teammates were behind me so if i made a mistake a three minute mistake i know there's someone behind me that that will lead mm -hmm. me the right way yeah yeah but it's just dude it's it's hard to explain because you don't you don't know until you're there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Man, that's a crazy uh, That's a crazy way to win that race. Like, you just had it pretty much, like, under control, but scared. Like, scaredly <laughs> under control the entire time. Like, you, it's all, you'd almost just be, like, waiting for the gotcha moment where that role was where it wasn't stop. in control but yeah because like you it's never safe it's never guaranteed no. out there you know like the level of anxiety that you must have had would have been through the roof bro yeah people are like oh you know you controlled the race well but yeah. dude it's yeah i i tried to but one little thing and you're not in control anymore so i i think like the best thing i did was just keep calm you know and like stay level-headed keep calm and then just ride your own your own race don't worry about it's easy to say don't worry about everyone else but dude oh that's the, the, the only thing you're worrying challenge. about is yeah. everyone else yeah yeah so no it, it was uh it, it couldn't have gone better honestly like in 2020 on stage uh three i was way in the back so i made a big push and i gained a big gap you know so i was able to maintain in 20 way easier because i had like a 17 minute lead on mm. day three but at this rally, dude, times were freaking one second, seven seconds, three minutes. Like that's it, crazy. It man. was slowly building, but you know, I, in my opinion, I want a big gap right away so I can cakewalk it. But no, the boys definitely kept us like on our toes all two weeks. And like I said, I was waiting for, you know, I was waiting for Toby to freaking make a big push one day and just kill us. But I don't know. I it just everything worked out so perfect this rally that i it how do you repeat that mm -hmm. you, you can't it's it's impossible so i think for the future just the only thing i could think of is just stay calm i guess yeah yeah you've, you it's that race presents itself to you though yeah 100%. you know like it, it it's would be very hard i mean I just don't think you go and dominate the Dakar and fully have it under control. Like, I mean, it, this sounds like that as much as you possibly can in a sense, but it's like, you know, just the, it's set up by the first day and then the second day. It's just like, it slowly is this evolving thing that you've got to kind of manage, but you almost can't ever have a plan going into a, a dakar rally you know you can have a plan but <laughs> if it works no one's gonna respect it yeah yeah you can have a plan but if it works that's a miracle yeah yeah and if it doesn't then that's rally yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah. has the level increased a bunch in the last few years like it really seems like even talking to tobes like i think from the first year he did it to the last time we would have spoke about it he's like dude it's getting pretty gnarly so yeah because toby started in 15 it was his first dakar i believe 
my first Dakar was 16. So, you know, the bikes have evolved, you know, they're more fast, they're more agile, you know, they're, they're more motor motocross style, you know, they're, they're, they're quick handling and, uh, the speeds now, okay. People say the speeds back in the day were fast, which I'm not taking that from them. The speeds for sure were fast back in the day with their twin cylinder freaking bikes. But now with the rally, like within the last couple of years, it's a freaking, it's like a sprint enduro. It's a long distance sprint enduro because I mean, there's, you could play all the games you want, but you don't want to play games because, uh, you, you play a game, you're going to lose five minutes mm. where right now, obviously looking back at this rally with a one second gap, dude, we're, we're on the gas the whole time. That's yeah, like, well, cup downhill times. <laughs> yeah. So as, as you talk to Toby, you know, in the earlier years of our career in rally was more, uh, game playing, more figuring out, you know, if you're going to stop on side of the road for a couple minutes, but now you stop on side of the road for a couple minutes, that couple minutes is going to put you way in left field and you're not going to have a chance to, to win. So now within the last four years, it's a, it's a moto race, dude, from the start of the special to the end. It's, it's no, you know, lollygagging around. Mm. And that's where I think it's involved. You know, we're riding, hell of a lot faster and hell of a lot more aggressive you know we're we're not just in the dunes just going taking it all in yeah Yeah. we're we're jumping and risking a lot oh man yeah like there's the some of the boys that i ride with in dakar that are in dubai like they they're all dakar and, and the rally guys they're no joke man like the guys that are out there training and they are fully sending shit. And so like, you know, Belushi. Yeah. 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 So I spend like a bunch of time with Belushi, um, in Dubai and like he, the way he explains, like even reading the dunes, like how he knows what's on the other side of it, you know, like just the, from the color and the shape and the way that the wind has been blowing the night before, like there's a crazy art to going, fast in the dunes in the way that you guys do you know and and like you you've never seen any of this stuff you're doing it for the first time at 100 miles an hour like it it is pretty out of control and the level for it to just keep going and going every year it just steps up and up and up yeah it's 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 crazy and you know they the organization wants us to slow down but it's like dude the bikes and the competition when like you, and you guys are just so good yeah it, and now and that's another thing is when toby started and when i started uh dude these guys weren't training mm. they were just flying in racing and flying out then you know i started training here and then uh the other team started training and now uh all the teams Dude, they're they're training through the whole year. Where I think in the older days, they just showed up and raced. But now it's like the teams show up a week before the race, do some training, race, go home, take a week off, and then they're back in the road books training at home. Mm. And that's where I think the level is, uh, you know, it, it's it's going up because now the organization wants us to slow down, so they're gonna make a tricky road book. Well we're kind of ahead of that because we're already training you know for some tricky road books yeah (laughs) yeah and they're they're you know they're probably scratching their head like how the hell are these guys doing this road book you know so good and so fast we spend all year you know training for you to basically screw us over yeah so that's i think where like the level got so intense is everyone started figuring out everyone's plans and ideas of going home and training before they go racing where I mean, yeah, you go home and go to the gym, go ride motocross, but that's not training for rally. Rally's doing road books, mm. and that's where I think the level went up. Is everyone figured that out? And now teams are just okay. We're gonna go to Morocco for two weeks just to go training. Yeah, dude, that was never done before. Yeah, 
KTM is coming to, you know, America now to do their training and to do their, their, their. That's very recent. Yeah. Since 2021. Yeah. So. They're building their bikes out here. They're doing their testing out here. Honda's been out here for doing that since 2012 on the rally bikes. So who who's next to come out here, you know? Yeah. And do you see, like, where do you see it going from here in terms of the level? Like, do you think, do you think that there's like more like up and coming people that are going to start looking and like train younger and younger and younger to try and get into it because i mean it's lucrative dude like it, there's big money big bonuses like it's a it's a prestigious event to win it can like really set you up like if you if you can win dakar multiple times like you can really set your life up yeah i mean that's the ultimate goal is to win multiple times and have your life set up uh but the the younger generation like the younger kids um there's not too many young kids in rally it's a it's a like a it's a man's sport it's a mature sport you know yeah. you you can't just send a kid out there and be like all right well yeah. just yeah. go wide open you know you have to really take care of the machine take care of yourself not get lost not crash and you bring a fired up you know 18 year old out there what's the yeah, it might not be the best recipe. Yeah, and, you know, typically, like, a young rally racer, and, I mean, right now, Mason, he's a young rally racer, but, like, the average age for rally is, like, 25, you know? That's, like, typically, like, the young person, and that's when I started. That's my teammate started at 25. I think all the all of us where we're at was 25, I think. Toby yeah, was the same. same. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and the older you get, obviously, you know, it's not super cross. You're not, you're not trying to battle the kids when you're 35 years old, but I, th I would say like 30 to 37 is kind of like the prime for rally just because, you know, if, if you start at 25 or 26, yeah, you couple can get years, that experience, couple years experience to know what's going on. Then by the time you're 30, you know, you're, you're fired up. You have four years of experience you know what's coming you've matured as a person and uh I, I think that's like the safest bet and i think that's like the the prime you know yeah so it, it's not like a super young person's sport it but you if you're going to be young you have to be smart and realize okay like this is fucking dangerous yeah don't just go think you're going to win on the first day keep your cool so i I would like to see like younger people get into it, but as I mentioned earlier, if you're a younger person getting into it, maybe go, you know, do some training with Jimmy Lewis and then go to Sonora Rally just so you get your feet wet in something to know if that's what you want to do. Mm. But yeah. yeah, tough tough gig, tough tough gig to get into or tough game yeah. to get into. Everyone that everyone that did get into Dakar has a pretty crazy story of of how it happened it seems like you know whether you talk to toes whether you talk to skyla yourself like it's very it's like a it's almost a path that you can't set yourself up for. yeah in a in a sense you know it almost seems like everyone that's gone to dakar and done well at dakar has been a very like kind of weird road to get there i think maybe chucky like tobes kind of paved the way a little bit for Chucky in a sense because they did all the same races in Australia. They, you know, like kind of were on the same brand. So maybe Chucky's pathway into it was a little bit um, maybe more laid out. But I mean, even still, yeah, it just seems like everyone that ends up doing Dakar kind of has like a really strange way that they got into it. And it was like, I never planned on this, but here we are. Yeah, I mean, dude, they don't make the Dakar easy, let alone like getting to Dakar is not easy. So... Was it, it's how much is it to even enter? It's like it's pretty twenty five grand. It's gnarly, huh? Well, that's dude. That's just your. That's just like your 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 paper with your signature. Like, there's my entry fee right there. But now you want to go rent a bike. It's another thirty grand. You break the bike. You break the bike. Now you got to buy parts. <laughs> you need you need somewhere to sleep. So you need a motorhome. Yeah. So I think like the cheapest way that you can do the Dakar would be like the original by mode tool like the the iron man 
guys that you know work on their own bikes, sleep in their own tent. God, that's savage. Yeah, I think this way to do it is probably like fifty grand. But dude, you you write a fifty thousand dollar check and you hope it all works out. <laughs> it's like a lot of people are like, man, I. That race doesn't mean that much to me. I'd rather have that, you know, in the bank. But <laughs> yeah, it's experience, and who knows where it can lead to? You know, yeah, it could lead to so many things, or you could shit the bed and blow your money and not have a good experience. Yeah, but it's a it's a risk you have to be willing to take. Yeah. So I think like like you said, I think everyone that's into rally has a a different story, and I think every story is unique. You know. How, how I got into it, how Skyler got into it. Skyler freaking sold his life. He has a crazy yeah. story to do what he did, man. Yeah, so, you know, everyone has a different story, and it's not easy to get to Dakar, and it's not easy to be in the Dakar. So they definitely don't make Let it Let alone to be successful in the race, too. Yeah, they don't make it, they don't make it easy. At any, any step of the way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, any step of the way. So it's it's quite a mission to to get there. And hats off to everyone that's, you know, got there on their own. My girlfriend did the same thing this year. She, you know, fundraised, sold some cars and, you know, kind of went like Skyler's route to get to Dakar. But she raced a side-by-side. And oh, sick. That's 400 grand. No. Yeah. Fuck. So. Like, How'd she go? She did good. Sick. Right, right. She was doing really good and uh, <laughs> stage 11, like, kicked her, kicked her ass, but. For her first Dakar, she got a stage win, first American female. Wow, that's yeah. epic. Yeah, and she was on a podium spot, but stage eleven like had some issues and kind of knocked her back. But yeah, first first American female to get a stage win and her first Dakar, and she's like, uh, she's she's really competitive and uh, she's like really mad at herself. But dude, for your first Dakar to get a stage win and finish fourth in the class, like that's an accomplishment like you yeah, said huge. earlier yeah. you finish and you're accomplished you know yeah so no she's she's upset she wanted to win she wanted to be on the podium but dude the dakar is not easy you finish a dakar that's a win the next the first step get the dakar second step finish a dakar yeah. third step okay go back and win yeah but you have to go first to figure it all out yeah not easy how stressful was it knowing that your girlfriend was in the race as well so it, I mean, it wasn't too stressful because we we started so early, and uh, by the time we got back to the bivouac, you know, they have like that Dakar app you could follow. Yeah, yeah. So I just check in at the waypoints, and then she brought um, like an assistant. Her name's Cynthia, so I would text Cynthia and kind of get some updates. Cause I think Cynthia had a, uh, you know, more knowledgeable updates than what I could get just from my phone. So yeah, we you know checking in every day, but I think we saw each other like twice in the whole rally. No just, shit. So you guys weren't able to like sleep in the same place. No, and, no, no way. Nah, dude, she was coming into the bivouac as like our lights were going out. Cause you know, they, yeah, they start like they're after they start like four hours after the bikes. Yeah. So, and, and they're a little bit slower on the stage. So by the time they get in, it's like seven, 8 PM. And you're just about to go to bed. Yeah. Cause we're waking up in a couple hours. <laughs> dude, that's gnarly. Yeah. So did you have any sketchy moments this year? Stage 10, um, no sketchy moments the whole rally, but stage 10, dude, like 800 meters before the finish was like a, was like a, a fast valley, but you know, a little rise, but had some sand ruts in it. And, uh, I was like, I was going full gas. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna sit down and like nail this corner. But right when I sat down and put my left leg out, dude, my, my, my left boot caught the rut, dude, twisted my leg all the way back, ripped my leg off the oh. motorcycle. I heard a, I heard a pop in my ankle, like through my earplugs and the sound of the motorcycle. And now like, are oh, you were limping when you walked in here? Yeah. No, my, my ankle is like black and green right now. No shit. Yeah. So stage 11, I couldn't even walk after stage 10, dude. I got, you know, some work done on it. They taped it up for stage 11, but the adrenaline, you know, like you don't really realize the adrenaline, what the effect of that does against pain. It's insane. eh? Yeah. So toughed it out it hurt took some like uh pain reliever like uh asp not aspirin but like advil or something to yeah. make the pain less and uh i got home whatever was limping and then uh 
it just it's getting worse and worse by the day but i don't know i for sure like something's torn in there because it's like the size of a baseball and uh it's black and green so yeah i, wa- I want to ride dude it's freaking been raining it's so sick out here right now and i want to yeah. go riding but yeah dude to get my foot in the boot would be a pain in the ass and then by the time i'm done riding i don't even know if i'll get my foot out of the boot so yeah kind of just you know scratching my head just looking at everyone else go riding but oh, i know the hills have looked amazing in the moment oh, eh? dude it, it's yeah it's so good right now where where do you stay most of the time so i i moved to arizona yeah that's what i thought when we spoke in Abu Dhabi. i thought you're in arizona i moved to arizona and um my parents live in asperia so like top cone pass close to Glen helen yeah yeah and every time i come out here i just stay there yeah but when i come out here i bring my mountain bike my moto bike my desert bike so I could like kind of pick and choose and be here for a couple days. But this time I couldn't bring anything cause I was like, dude, my ankle, it's, it's a freaking cankle right now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I need to get it checked out, but you just on a victory lap though. Yeah. That, that can wait. Yeah. It's like, I'll just wait. You know, if I spend my day going to the doctors, what are they going to tell me? Oh, just stay off it for a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I could just, I could have told myself that instead of waste my day going to the doctor. So that's what I'm trying first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, when you got you got the supercross, you got you know all the interviews that you're doing, and you're you're in the man guy right now. So yeah, I'm running got no around. time for that shit. Exactly. Limp around, get it done. Yeah. The uh, the high des is a bit of a I don't know if it's like a secret gem, but fuck, it's pretty cool up there, eh? Hey, the best riding, dude. Everyone says it, but everyone from from the high des. I'm real good friends with Kiefer. Oh yeah, yeah. So Kiefer, I mean, he he has a lot of like secret tracks. You know, he does a he does a really good job making all these little tracks. He, I don't know. He just has I don't, I don't know. He just builds tracks to go riding. Yeah. But they're always really good. And like Travis Preston's up there. Obviously, uh, Kiefer's kids doing really good. Yeah. So I think you know between Kiefer and uh, Travis, I think they're kind of grooming Aiden. You know. So keep going up and uh i think it keeps travis and chris like on point and do the tracks that they have are i mean when i was racing here in hounds dude in, in 2015 16 17 and 18 i was riding with uh Kiefer and gary sutherland every day on these tracks you know and i think that's what made you know groom me into where i'm at today because you know Kiefer is i don't know how old that guy is got to be damn near close to 50. Yeah, he'd be getting there. He'd but, be getting there. But, dude, he rips. Fully rips, bro. And I'm like, okay, well, this guy's freaking way older than me, but I'm going to you know, I'm gonna latch on to him and see what he's doing. So that's kind of like what I was doing when I was racing Heron Hounds in 15, 16, 17, 18. And like I said, I think that's what, like, groomed me to be where I'm at today. But it, the tracks are sick, especially right now with the rain. I'm sure he's out there. No, nah, he's on the East Coast right now. He's pissed. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah, he, he's bummed because it rained and he wants to be home riding. Yeah, but and, I know they scored a good last time. Yeah. The, the, the last rain that they had. So now he's on the East Coast riding in mud. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kiefer does a good job building tracks. Uh, we have multiple trails, and it's all in the same area. You can go rip a 30-minute moto on this track right here. And if you're, like, bored, you can go ride, you know, these enduro trails that are also super sick. And, you know, I, that's where I grew up, and that's I was able to ride every single day on this stuff. So I, the desert's the, the spot, but I don't know how long it's going to last. You know, everything's being built up, and yeah, really, it's eventually going to go away. But right now is the time to to go. Yeah, get it before before it's not there anymore. Yeah, yeah, man. It's it's I always see the videos and stuff that he's posting on the tracks. He he's always asking me to come ride, but I haven't been able to get up there yet. But dude, I want to get up there so bad. Yeah, Just, you, you got to go when it's like raining. I mean, you can go if it's dry or like when it's dry if you want. But the experience that you have when it's wet, dude, you'll be like, fuck, unreal. Yeah, the dirt is so good. It's like. It's unreal. Keith was telling me the other day that uh, I can't remember when it was, but him and Aiden were doing like a, a proper moto, and uh, and Aiden caught him, and he just couldn't pass him, and he was like revving him, revving him, <laughs> rev- and so he just fully blacked out and just cleaned them both out, and like he said that he went, 
fucking flying and they were just fully in each other he's like bro had the heaviest moment in the, <laughs> ever with aiden like fully in each other's girl he's like the little fuckers getting old enough to uh to really get into me these days take out his dad oh, yeah it's, it's funny they're always uh you know comparing lap times and i it's so it's so good to have you know chris and aiden you know i mean yeah aiden rips but dude to have I mean, a good mentor like his dad, his dad freaking rips still. And like his dad can help Aiden. Like, no, this is what I did. And, you know, Aiden, I hopefully Aiden sees that and like follows it. But dude, Kiefer freaking rips for the age. Like, dude. And but, he, he's just the most solid dude too. Yeah. The nicest, the, the whole family is actually. Yeah. No, I, I love them. They're, they're awesome. I don't see them that much anymore because I moved away, but no, they're good people. And Arizona's, I mean, kind of similar, I guess. You put guys probably get less less rain, but um, I mean, similar desert, and I'm sure that there's a lot of tracks and stuff out there as well. No tracks out there. There's one in Havasu. Oh, really? I haven't ridden it, but like our trails are super sick. Yeah. And like from from Hesperia to where I live now is like two hours and twenty minutes, so it's not far. It's just on the other end of like the Mojave Desert. Yeah. But uh. You know, I come to Asperia and I bring my mountain bike, my moto bike, and my desert bike, and I'll stay here for, you know, three days, four days, and I'll kind of, you know, I'll ride Glen Helen, and then I'll ride mountain bikes, or if I, you know, everyone wants to go ride the desert, I'll ride the desert. But normally I come down here just to go ride moto, because I can ride the desert at home, but no, I, I, I try to make my time worth it when I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I'm bummed I haven't seen you at Glen Helen before. I was I'm sure, dude, I'm, I... I, I'm almost positive the last time I was there, you were there uh, riding because I saw your uh, story. Ah, uh, dude, I didn't. Th I don't think I saw you out there. Though. Dude, I, I parked by myself. I ride to like one o'clock and I'm out of there. What's your program when you're there, ride wise? How long in motos are you trying to do? Uh, so I'm not like a big uh, watch guy yeah. or like heart rate monitor guy. <laughs> and Kiefer tried multiple years and times to get me on this program, but I'm like, dude. I just put my gear on and I ride. So, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever, like 20 minute motos is, is good. I'm, I'm not racing motocross. I don't need to go kill myself, but I just think like the, you know, the corners, the jumping and just like the way you ride moto helps so much for off road that, you know, 20 minute motos, three of those a couple fun laps call it a day, but I'm not a moto guy. I'm, I'm kind of big. So, uh, I just ride moto to help me and other like moto is really good for you, like to keep you flexible for mm. enduro style stuff you know because you're leaning the bike so much you know you're getting your leg way up there a lot more movement on the bike and it, it all it all helps you know and i think the same for for uh trail riding yeah 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 like the moto guys don't do trail riding but if they did trail riding in my opinion i believe that if they did trail riding like technical stuff in the rocks it could help, you know, it could make a benefit somewhere in moto because how would only moto help, you know, enduro guys? Mm. So I'm no, no, I do. I fully agree. Like when we, we do these big rides in, in Oz where we go to the tip of Australia and back. So it's like, I don't know, 3000 Ks up and, and back or whatever. And you're on the bike for two weeks. It's like, it's our own little Dakar, but we're getting on the piss every night and <laughs> sleep, sleeping in swags. We got all the, all the support vehicles and that. But the end of that, it's funny. Like I actually had one day that there was like one moment I remember. It was like, I think it was the last or maybe second last day. So, I mean, we're doing like eight hours on the bike pretty much every day, like through single track, fire roads and got all the maps. Well, we got all the routes kind of pre-planned or whatever. And there's 16, 17 bikes, different skill levels. So you can kind of like send it or hang back and yeah. go a bit slower. But there was like one day I drove out, filled my bike up and I rode out and I didn't even put my hand, my other hand on the handlebar until I was doing like 130 Ks an hour. <laughs> and I'm just like, I look down at the speed. I'm like, fuck, you get way too comfortable. Like when you do back to back to back to back to yeah. back days and then you just start to notice that you're doing things on the bike. It's way more of just like an extension of you because you're putting so much more like physical hours of riding on the bike. And you could do 
that's probably one day of riding is probably like eight, nine, ten days of moto. Yeah. So it's like to to be able to, and then if you do that back to back to back to back to back, the bike skill and ju- it's just like a general feeling that you have. Like even you know, oh fuck, I got to turn around. You're just ripping ripping yourself around. It's it sounds like silly and trivial, but you get back on a moto track after that and you just feel so much more comfortable on your dirt bike. Yeah, I mean, the, the balance. Mm. When you're riding enduro trails, it's all about balance and throttle control. Like, okay, the motocross and supercross guys, really good riders. But, you know, the average person, if, if they went to enduro trails and, you know, they're doing some balance things or some throttle control things, then you go to the motocross track and it's not like a quick whack of the throttle, you know, out of the corners, you're more like slow, you know, traction. You're finding the traction rather than freaking whacking the throttle, catching a wheelie. And next yeah. thing you know, you've got your legs on the ground. Yeah. I think, you know, as you said, both benefit from each other for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, you like you said, too, you <laughs> a couple of days on the bike, you get more confident, more comfortable. Next thing you know, you're doing 130 kilometers an hour with one arm. And you're like, uh, yeah. what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, and you just like, I mean, it's not like that's gnarly or it's hard or anything, but it's more like the first couple of days you're doing 80 and you're like. White knuckles. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> fucking hell, I'm really moving, boys. <laughs> Someone want to slow down here. And like the, the first year that we did that trip, I had the, another moment where like, we rode the same road one way and then on the way home we rode it back normally most of the trip you don't go back and forwards the same way basically but there's like one little section of road where you do and i think on the first day was 80 k's on the it's just like a single lane dirt road through the bush you know and you've yeah. got like kangaroos everywhere big ant hills just full like desert sort of scrub and uh, first day, you're like 80 k's, boop, 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 yeah, and then the, on the way back, just 130, <laughs> full gas, <laughs> and then you just you end up stopping for a piss, and you're just like, fuck, that escalated like yeah. really, really, really quickly. You get comfortable, which is kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any like other, I guess, races that you'd like to go and do throughout the world? Like, I'm sure you've heard of Fink. Like, yeah, any ambitions to go and do that or? Dude, Fink sounds fun. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about it. I just, I think it's a little bit sketchy to go race Fink with fucking kangaroos jumping out everywhere, but. It's pretty gnarly. <laughs> yeah, dude. And Toby was saying the boys are, dude, you're just wide open the whole time. Basically, yeah. Have you seen footage of Toby out there? Dude, yeah. The jumps? Yeah. They're, they're not even, they shouldn't be jumps, but he's like, dude, wide open yeah no i don't know man <laughs> yeah I don't know, but brother. it's different if you grow up out there doing that yeah you know like toby and all the guys that race fink you know that they know it so well that for an american to go out there i mean how many years behind would i be if i go do it one oh, time it, it'd be a novelty like it's not a race you could go and be like oh i want to try and win like, no it's you'd, years you'd, yeah you'd have to just go there for basically fun it's yeah. a it's the craziest weekend though or well, like well like, yeah i guess it's a, you, you end up being out there for a week but it's like literally the dead center of australia like the geographical center of australia is like 300 k's away oh. from the finish line of the wow. of the race it's fucking mental dude and the whole it takes over the whole town it's the only thing that's going on there's like forty thousand fans line oh. the line the uh the track and it's just an absolute zen fest and you you get a local dude that basically doesn't do any other race and he just that one and he can get like third and there's the best dudes in australia go and race it like it's it's fucking wild dude wild experience yeah that's uh i've talked to toby about it dude and i for sure that's a race that you know the more you do it you know the more you know and the better you are. So like for a first timer to come in, like you said, it's just a uh, experience. Yeah. But no, that race, I mean, all my friends, we, we talk about it, we watch it and we're like, dude, it's fucking so gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so unique. Eh? Dude, it's literally just a sprint for two hours. Yeah. And then you do it again the next day. Yeah. Backwards. Backwards. Yeah. And they remember the track both ways. Like that's why Tobes did so good in the truck because like the guys that, do it traditionally in the truck they're truck drivers 
And so like they've just they you can't get the laps in. So and at speed, like you, maybe you can get in like a, a side by side and you can you know run the track in the side by side. But the speed's so slow compared to the trophy truck or the yeah. buggy that you're in. So Tobes is running like well, he's going faster than the buggy. So it's like he's memorizing the track at speed way more and that's why he just cleaned up. Like Yeah, he's legend so, races it one way, flies back hops in the truck races the truck wakes up the next morning yeah. rides down flies back up <laughs> it's pretty insane eh? dude just pre-ran at you know 180 kilometers an hour both ways and <laughs> yeah. then race the truck at 200 kilometers an hour yeah all right guys clear boys yeah unbelievable dude so what about any other races that you've got kind of on the on the bucket list I f- surely honda's down to send a bike wherever you want to go these days yeah so i mean right now we just got back from dakar and uh it's like the first week, but definitely thinking about doing, uh, some other races. Uh, obviously we have the world championship, but, uh, that's, there's only like five of those a year. So try to find something, you know, in the middle here, stateside, a little bit closer to home for fun. Yeah. Like some sprint enduros. Those are typically pretty fun. Cause I mean, they're not easy, but it's just something to do. Yeah. And, uh, maybe some long distance races, uh, in the future, but, you know, this is something that we have to talk with Honda just to see, like, if it's yeah. doable, if, if they'll allow me to do it. Yeah. But for right now, uh, there's nothing that, you know, I have that I'm Set like, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I'm doing this for sure. Yeah. Because right now I'm still kind of like, okay, well, what can we do? And, you know, can we do it? Well, will Honda send a bike? So right now, nothing set in stone. Oh, I actually, what are you doing March 9th? You busy? I don't know. How far is Mesquite from your place? Mesquite, Nevada. That's where uh, that's where I crashed. Oh, <laughs> is it? Yeah, but that's like uh, two hours, two dude, and a half hours. Dude, come do an Ironman at my race. We're doing an eight-hour enduro. In Mesquite, Nevada? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're doing the, you know where the World Mini Track is? Yeah. Yeah, so we're doing, it's, it's called a Gypsy 500. We're doing, it's 500 minutes, so like eight hours, 20 minutes. And it's either like you do it Ironman or it's a two, three or four man team. And basically it's like half a lap on the, on the moto track. And then you do like the full GNCC loop and then you come peel on, do the last half of the, uh, the moto track. And then if you, with a team, you hand off your transponder. But if you're a salt, if you're an Ironman savage like yourself. Oh man, that's actually sounds fun. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to talk Skylar into doing it as well. Well, for, yeah, he lives like 30 minutes from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be pretty sick. Maybe me and Skylar should just team up. Dude, <laughs> that would be savage if yeah. you guys did that. No, that's that's not far for either of us. I mean, it's farther for me, but it's only two hours, two and a half hours. I'll spot you an entry. How about that? Yeah, I mean, oh. you have like a flyer, you just backdoor it. What's that? You got a flyer they're going to post or? No, it, it, it's almost sold out. We've got like 200 teams entered. Holy shit. Yeah. It's gonna, so it's big. Oh, it's going to be sick as fuck. Yeah. Dude, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. Skyler just posted a, a video the other day, like following his mate through the desert. Yeah. Turn track. Yeah. And I was like, what are you doing March 9th? And he's he's like, oh, I might be somewhere else, but if I'm around, I'll come and do it. Yeah. You should come and do it. If if we're around, if Skyler has to be somewhere. You probably have to yeah, be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. That sounds fun. That'd be super rad to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's just that we, we do those races at home. They're called Transmoto Series. And the the guys at Verb Moto, they hit me up and they're like, oh, look, we got to do a race together. Like, because they do their Shred Tour Series. Yeah. And I was like, if I'm doing a race, it's got to be this. And that's like, dude, Tobes does them. Tobes actually did one Ironman on his rally bike. One. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, one year. It was fucking gnarly too. <laughs> it was the, I can't remember what what year it was but it was like crazy dusty dude and uh he he passed me on the rally bike there was like this one hill climb they ended up taking the hill climb out and uh it was so dusty and there was just bikes everywhere up this hill climb (laughs) and i heard toby behind me on the rally bike and i was like fuck i need to try and get up this hill i couldn't see shit so i've just (laughs) sent it hit a chick's bike (laughs) it was a chick had laid over and i just went over the bars up this hill Next thing I just hear, oh, yeah, oh, and Toby <laughs> is just zigzagging his way <laughs> through this carnage, bro, on this rally bike. And all the dudes and chicks that were like down on the side of the track with their fucking bikes sprawled oh around. Oh my God. Like, ah. <laughs> Dude, it was the funniest shit of all time. Friggin' Toby. 
So yeah, maybe that's maybe that's a race you could do. I'd be pumped to have you, mate. Yeah. We'll comp your entry. We'll have to check it out. Like if we're in town or if we're at a rally, I don't know, but if we're in town, let's do it. Fucking sick. So uh you've been following the supercross while you're over there? Were you able to were you able to see any highlights? Were you you caught up on the season? Dude, the only thing like well, the first round we were in we were in Dakar. The second round we just finished in Dakar, but uh Dude, the hot thing right now is what happened with uh, Jet and Jason. Ooh, I'm like, yeah, give me a take. I don't even know what happened. That's a problem. Like, what do you mean? They they were they were racing, bumping elbows, but I, like at the finish line, Jet was fired up over it or something. Yeah, he was pissed. But why was he pissed? Well, I think did you see the footage of like Ando and him? Basically, he was pissed because Ando was doing his job, man. <laughs> Ando was trying to keep him behind him. And he was not happy. That that had some like kind of sketchy moments, but yeah, I think Jet just lost his cool. No, I, I I agree. Like, dude, like you're bumping elbows, no big deal. No one took each other. No one took someone out. Yeah, you you rubbed a little bit, but yeah, I think Jet definitely. I think got got fired up, way too fired up for what <laughs> happened. Yeah, but I was like, I'm like, what the why like what's going on it, it wasn't that bad like neither of you guys crashed over it you yeah rubbin's racing you guys were doing good like if it was a dry supercross would that have happened maybe not but hey that i thought it was awesome it gave the fans something to watch oh yeah <laughs> everyone's into it yeah i actually had ando in here last night talking about it really yeah yeah he's over it now i think it was just one of those one of those things that you know heat, heat of the moment kind of shit for jet it was heat of the moment for sure but i think like maybe jet took it a little bit too far like at the end of the race like they were grabbing each other's helmets like dude just at the end of the race be like hey what the fuck like why 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 were you doing that to me blah yeah. blah what well why were you doing that to me yeah but it's like dude at the end of the day they were racing they were both fighting for a position and yeah know, like fourth yeah but like way up there but I mean, you're not just going to give it away, you know? Like, you got to fight for it. Yeah. And I don't know if Jet uh, – I, I think Jet was maybe expecting Anderson just to be like, like go by. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, they're both fighting for points, right? So, you know, Jason's not going to give it away. No, he's the last person exactly. on the start line that is going to give that up. Exactly. And if, and if Jet was ahead of Jason and Jason was coming in for a pass – Jet ain't letting him pass. Exactly. So it's, I think it's over nothing. Yeah. But I just think they were fired up a little yeah. bit too much. Yeah. But hey, I hey, you know what though? It looked good. I love the passion. Yeah. I, like what it says to me is you got an eighteen, a nineteen year old kid that wants to win so fucking bad that he forgot that he was in a stadium with thirty five thousand people and live TV coverage and like literally the entire Supercross and Motocross world watching and like it's literally the shot is like in the background of ap's wind Dude, celebration that's you know? the best oh i'm just like oh my god yeah ap celebrating and in the background you just see the two guys fighting <laughs> but i mean at the end of the day everyone's watching it everyone's talking about it you guarantee well i mean the numbers are being crazy apparently on the like on peacock and on the streaming and stuff they said that it's like by far and away the best rating Supercross has ever had before this weekend even. So, I mean, huh. it's good for the sport, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the Supercross is always fun. And, dude, if you have a dry round every single round, in my opinion, it's kind of boring. Mm. Everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone's jumping the same. You know, if you get a whole shot, that guy's gone. But, dude, the mud... I think it's badass, dude. The freaking people just getting squirrely all over the place, and it creates a good race. Yeah. Well, this mud was gnarly. Like, I think San Francisco was full survival mode. Like, the guys, it was... I like that. Yeah. Oh, but the, there wasn't a lot of racing, in a sense. It was, like, a lot of surviving. And you got to really... You got to kind of see who... I think it's probably like a mindset thing, which you could probably speak to as a Dakar guy, you know? It's like the mindset that you take into those difficult situations. And like there was even a vital interview with Jet where he was saying like, oh, I wish they canceled it. And it was, I didn't want to be there. And it's like, you kind of see that in the results in a way. And then you see the guys that are just like, fuck it. 
Like this is yeah. what this is what we're doing. And they go out and like Eli did great, Kenny did great. Like you kind of see the guys that just mentally are down to go through it. But then this weekend in San Diego was gnarly in a sense because you could do the triple, you could do a lot of the jumps, but it was fucking sketchy. Yeah, so the slick. guys were full. The guys that were sending it were sending it. It was not cool. It was not cool. Yeah, I mean like Toby's thing, rain, hell or shine. Dude, you're going to go out there and ride. Dude. Hey, you signed up for it. Okay, if you're not a mud rider, then, dude, you can't win them all. Yeah. If you win them all, that's not a good, I mean, yeah, it's good for you. Yeah. But it doesn't give the fans like, okay, if, if you get the whole shot and you're just like that solid on a dry track, that guy's gone. Yeah. But with the mud, dude, like look at look at the results. Like how about freaking Plessinger? Dude's sweeping it up. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I think. I think he I spoke to him at press day and I was like bro do you feel do you feel good and he's like yeah I actually feel really good because I watched him I was like just watching the Instagram edits and shit and I'm like fuck he actually looks like he's ripping so I just think he's ready this year like yeah. I just think he's gonna be I think he's gonna be there maybe the more than what I don't I mean it's a long season but I don't think that he just won because it was a mud race yeah. like I actually think that he's a guy that can win this year well, in, in any condition. Well, from last year, you know, when he had the, led Detroit. the whole race, dude. In Detroit. Yeah. Damn. And I think that, you know, that might have got like in his head, like, I can win. I, I can do this. Yeah. And then obviously, whatever things happened throughout the year and, you know, New Year, he was fired up and he's like, I, I've done it before. I can do it again. So I'm going to, you know, I'm fired up. I want to do this. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, hopefully, yeah, I, I like the guy. He's freaking He's amazing. awesome. Dude. Have you ever got to hang out with him at no, all? No, no. But I just like from following him and yeah. interviews and stuff, I I think he's like a real down to earth guy. And he's the same in person. Yeah. You know, like he's just that. He's just that guy. Well, we'll see this weekend. Let's see if he puts it together and does it again. Yeah. Can you relate to that with like when you, I mean, how long did it take you to get a stage win at, at Dakar? My first, uh, I got a stage win in my second year. Yeah. But uh, it was only like my second Dakar, and I had no idea what the fuck I was doing out there. Dude, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm opening the day, dude. I got lost like kilometer twenty. But yeah, no, it's it's nerve wracking. But yeah, like if if you've done it before, you tell yourself like, well, I've done it, I can do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And once you know you could do it again, or once you know you've done it and it can be possible then I think it puts you on another level of, of like hard work, you know, like if you're not ever getting to the top, then I think you start going down. But then if you got to the top, you know, and then you don't have so much success and you start falling down, but then you stop and think about it. Like, well, I'm the same guy. I'm the same guy. Yeah. I've done it before. Yeah. Then you get all sparked up, fired up. And then you start working harder to reach that goal again. So, I mean, it's, it's the same in motocross. You have the, I think it's a lot of up and downs. Yeah. You have a good week. You have a good month. You have a bad day. Leads to a bad week. It leads to second guessing. And I think it just comes with the sport. Yeah. Ups and downs, dude. Headaches, non -head not headaches. Like, yeah. It's it's demanding and it's not easy. Hell, with, I mean, you, you, you have the world championship, but like you've got one race every year you want to win, basically, which yeah. is it's that it have to it's that's a good thing but then it's probably also kind of hard to like to stay not stay motivated but it's like when you've got something really far away just to to stay accountable to that goal over 365 days like you're sitting here right now you're the champ you're the double champ but in 340 days you'll be back there and you'll be trying to do the same thing like is it hard to or do you have to really train yourself to just like stay thinking about that goal? Like, honestly, I'm already thinking about the next one, but, uh, you know, you, you have to go, uh, you, you're in it, but then you have to step away from it, you know, for a week or two just to like decompress, decompress yeah. and then get back into it. And, um, yeah, obviously we want to win the Dakar and, you know, from when we get home end of January, we have, more or less 
time off until like August. And then around August is like when we start, you know, 100% focus for the Dakar because I mean, it takes that many months to get, mm. you know, prepared for it properly. I mean, the focus, dude, the diet, the training, it's, it's not easy to stay focused, you know, for 365 days a year on it. So yeah, you have to, you know, step away, come back in and, you know, and, and regroup. But no, I, I mean, I think about it every day. Like I'm already thinking about the next one, what we can do differently and what we can change on the bike and, uh, how we can train differently or where we can go to train that's different than where we've done the last eight years. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's a full-time job just thinking about it, but yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that process though is, I find the process of those things kind of fun though in itself too. You know, it's like to, to what stones can I, can I look under like to try and find something else like just, and it's coming down to seconds now, Yeah, you know, like you're, you're in this crazy game where you're doing these, this two week massive endurance race that is literally coming down to seconds. And it's like, you're now there's set. You can find seconds in tiny, tiny places and it's like, I think that would be a fun kind of like rewarding process to go through every year. You can find seconds in tiny places, but after 37 hours when you're only one second apart, that's a, that's a, that's a heavy feeling. And you know, it's, it's not easy to try to maintain that and you just have to keep pushing forward. <laughs> <laughs> so what, it, how much weight did you lose this year? Like, are you doing big weight fluctuations in the, the over the course of the two weeks? I don't think I'm losing too much weight, dude. We're we're eating freaking salmon and rice, dude, every night. Uh, we're eating burgers for lunch. Like, I, I don't know, maybe I lost five pounds, but okay, not not. So too you're not much. doing big weight swings because no. I know that Tobes had like some pretty big weight swings back in the day, and he'd like try and come in heavy because he knew that he was gonna lose heaps of weight. Yeah, I mean, I I don't try to go in heavy because yeah. I'm already heavy, so I'm trying to go the other way always, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I don't um I don't go on a scale, dude, so I, I couldn't tell you. I, I No scale, no heart rate monitor, just fucking raw dog in it. Yeah, I just I don't I don't like the scale, dude. Just if you feel good and your clothes fit and you're and you're riding good, <laughs> then stay there. <laughs> yeah. If you're like losing too much weight and then you go riding and next thing you know you're tired in ten minutes, then maybe where you were before you lost the weight or the muscle is where your body wants to be. I mean, you you should know where your body's happy. I mean, I'm a fat kid at heart, dude. I freaking, <laughs> I love ice cream and cake and brownies and cookies. I love all the stuff that's not good for you, but it's really hard to, you know, stay my lane and eat good. And I don't buy that shit, but yeah, dude, I got my parents' house. It's like full of it. Or I go to someone's <laughs> house. I'm like, yeah, give me that. Can I have a cookie? <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, you got sour candy? Yeah, no, it's bad. Oh, that's so funny. So you just, what? Uh, what's your thinking behind no heart rate monitor, no scales, none of it. You just, you don't want any of the details. You just want to like, you're a feeler, not a thinker. Uh, yeah, feeler, not a thinker. And I did the scale thing before and I did the heart rate thing before, but just uh, the scale, I mean, the scale just upsets me, you know, because I, <laughs> I think like, fuck, dude, I work my ass off, dude, and I eat. Well, lately I haven't, like this week I didn't eat too good because I'm at home and I'm like, dude, I'm going to eat whatever I want right now. Yeah, but yeah. Like before the Dakar or whatever, you know, I work my ass off. I eat as good as I can and I step on the scale and it's like, I'll be one pound lighter. And I'm like, dude, I worked my ass off for three months. I ate clean. I lost one pound. I was like, for me, that's stressful trying to work my, thinking I'm working my ass off and eating good and then stepping on the scale and not seeing the results that I'm, I should be seeing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just going to work my ass off and eat what I want. Yeah. And the scale, whatever. I yeah. go to the scale and I go to the doctors. <laughs> Dude, I love that. And no, like the, the heart rate monitor for me, like I've, I use it mainly for sleep and recovery. Like just to know where I'm at on my like HRV and then the kind of sleep that I got. Like right, right now this week, I probably pushed a bit too hard like with work and I had some really hard training sessions. So I'd 
look at my Garmin now and it's basically says like, don't train. Take a rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I rel- not rely on it, but I mean, I'd use that shit to make a lot of decisions. But with you, you're just fully going off like how you feel every day. Yeah, like if like if I'm tired, I know that I'm tired because I'll I'll know right away. Like if I if I go to the gym and I'm tired, but I don't wear like the heart rate monitor, and I go to the gym and I start like working out, and I'm like, okay, for sure the body's tired because I have zero energy, and I'm moving slow. Yeah. Then I'll just do the workout, but really slow and just to get movements, and then on the bike. Um, like for moto, whatever, I just do it anyways. <laughs> but definitely like how you said, like you're sleeping and like your sleep score or whatever, you definitely know like in the morning if you're tired. If you wake up early and like you're fired up, you're probably ready to go. But then if you wake up and you're like kind of slow moving, then that's another sign. Yeah. But I don't, just to worry about all that stuff is just extra extra stuff yeah your battery's fucking dead your watch ain't charged (laughs) your thing's not connecting to your phone it's (laughs) next thing you know you're like hey guys wait you gotta connect it you gotta lick your strap again and change (laughs) it it's difficult oh i fucking love it because i'm just the opposite i'm just i'm just that guy but and you know what i ain't winning shit (laughs) so maybe there's a method to the madness kiefer is all about the heart rate strap dude oh yeah yeah, maybe it's just vet guys. Maybe it's just maybe, vet guys. Maybe you're just not old enough yet, bro. Vet speed. Yeah. Shit. No, I don't. Yeah, I just, I just go for it, dude. Raw dog it. Yeah. Fucking like it, America, bro. I work Monday to Friday, and Saturday and Sunday is my day off. <laughs> it's two, simple. Yeah, two days of rest, all I need. How uh, how many days are you run like through the weeks normally? So before Dakar, uh, three days a week, like three road books a week. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then uh, if I'm not doing road books, I'll go to, like, two days motocross. Yeah. Or, like, if I don't go to motocross, I'll just ride trails. And then, like, some road biking. Yeah. And then, as far as the gym goes, what what kind of program do you run So, there? actually, I haven't gone to the gym uh, from, like, October to now. Just because I was trying something different. Like, going to the gym, like, you you, like, gain muscle, lose fat. You know, you get built up a little bit more. But I feel like the gym I was losing like flexibility mm. so I stopped going to the gym like just before Dakar to like try to gain flexibility in, on the motorcycle yeah I don't know if it worked I mean yeah we won the Dakar but I can't tell you it's because I didn't go to the gym <laughs> yeah but I could tell you like since I haven't gone to the gym in a couple months I'm not as sore mm. dude I go to the gym I'm freaking sore for like three days yeah like sometimes if it's a gnarly workout I can't even move the fucking next day yeah do you do much stretching no, that's why you, that's why you lose <laughs> flexibility right there, brother. <laughs> Man, I I do jujitsu and I if I'm not stretching, I'm fucked. Just stiff as a board, right, dude. Right, right now, cooked. I trained, what I I trained hard Monday and hard Wednesday, and I'm fully cooked. Like my back's fucked, my hips are so yeah. sore just from not. I and I haven't stretched, but if I'm if I'm warming up properly. And I'm stretching properly. And I do like a ton of, you know, like the lacrosse ball. Yeah. That's what I do the most of. Like, and. Like when, put it on your hip. Oh, your... yeah. Yeah. Because that there is from riding, especially like when you're like pointing your toe in, like with good technique, then that is like literally flexing the hip, flex a muscle like on the inside. That of goes your hip. to your back. Yeah. And then, and then there. And then you've got that. Have you ever. Um, have you ever been on one of those so ass, uh, so right, uh, stretching deals as well? It's like a lacrosse ball, but for like that muscle that runs from your femur to your spine, kind of like on the inside. And that's why your back hurts all the time is because that muscle. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Have you ever been on one of those things? Yeah. They're fucking unreal, yeah. dude. Dude, I go to the chiropractor and they have that thing and then they'll like stretch out that so ass dude. And if you're jacked, like beyond repair and you go in for the first time to like get that thing worked oh dude it's so painful yeah you're just you're on the table cringing you're like oh my god please it's, stop it's insane most people don't even know that that muscle exists well that muscle is important because it like how it loops back around yeah it's like yeah your back's hurting because of muscle that's on your front side yeah like, yeah wait what yeah 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 it's crazy 
you should you should just order one of those things and have it at home I'm, i lay on that thing all the time i think i get fucked up because i'm at a desk so much too so you're like constantly in a position where like your knees are up to uh, you so i mean it, it that that one really helps out a bunch it, the thing about me though dude is i'll lay on it for like 30 seconds i'm like all right i gotta get out of here i'm bored yeah <laughs> <laughs> like all right i think it worked yeah yeah i'm good now I'm yeah good. even though you should probably spend 30 minutes on it yeah yeah but i think it's just to be like to be the guy that can go and just fucking power through a two-week dacca you're probably just not going to be the guy that gives a shit yeah. about a lot of those you know it's like a personality trait thing it's like you're probably not the guy that's gonna just be doing all those just fully obsessing over all those little boxes because i mean at some point like i'm guessing you just need to switch your brain off yeah and just do the fucking thing exactly like you you can you can train or work to be so perfect in all those boxes but then when when time comes and you can't do all those boxes then i think mentally it, it jacks with you because you're like okay well i skipped i skipped box two three and five and now like oh fuck what do i do like i i don't feel like i'm lined up because i didn't get those boxes where you just put your mind to it and just do it i think is i mean it works for me yeah yeah and i could see the way that it would work you know because there's a there's just a point where none of that stuff would kind of matter yeah, and exactly. it's it's just you and the bike and doing the miles and holding the thing on. Exactly, like yeah, you. I mean, you could do all those boxes in a row, but I mean, when it's time to come, when 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 it's time to go down and and get to it, you know, you can't rely on those boxes that you check off every single day in your daily life. Like you're here to do this, and you you ain't got those boxes. You got to freaking do with what you got you know and some people have the mentality of like i'm a little bit this way too i guess like i do things that i know work and i stick to those every single day and like i do it in this order but i mean it's not it's not a crazy list but if i if i get you know if i go away from that while i'm racing it doesn't bother me mm. the the things i do in order is just at, for at home training and what is that like dude i wake up coffee bicycle breakfast i don't know ride ride or just do the thing the way i do things is like it's fairly simple but could be not simple for other people mm. but then there's people that have all these boxes they have to check off and the people that have all these boxes you know and they don't check them off does that mentally mess with them, them yeah or or are they going to be completely fine not checking those boxes off and that those are the two kinds of people where it's going to be you know a deal breaker yeah where i'm the guy that's like okay well if i can't check those boxes i'm going to be completely fine not even worry about it and go do my job yeah but then some people if it doesn't work out do they the wheels come off the wagon exactly yeah and i think for rally you need to not be that way you need to be like okay you need to be okay leaving everything at home or leaving everything the way it is and then just pushing through with with what they're throwing at you yeah what what's the hardest part about the dark off for you i mean dude the early mornings suck <laughs> uh the cold morning i hate being cold and like dude the mornings are so cold so cold and that's the worst thing to do because my, my hands are on the bo on the on the fence right now of being too cold but and it's not even cold in here yeah, yeah. but uh just being cold is the worst thing uh, the worst part about Dakar, I would say, is definitely probably like the long liaisons, just because, like that one day with 500 Ks on the liaison, it's like, dude, you're riding for six hours before you even go racing, and you're just on the highway, brrr, watching the speed, because you can't go over a certain speed, can't go over 120. Ugh. Yeah, but you don't want to ride. I mean, I don't know. I ride like 110, 113. Yeah, you don't want to even get close. Yeah, I mean, because next thing you know, dude, you go in 118, you blurt the throttle, you're doing 121. That's just penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's easy just to be 110 to 115. Yeah. But, no, the the riding was was nice. You know, it's physical, but I enjoy that. And it's just like the highways, they just go on. And especially when you start the highway section at, dude, 445 in the morning, sun don't come up till 
eight. Yeah, you can't even see anything. It's not even like you can look at shit. So you have like your road book right here in front of you. Then you have like your GPS right at the bars. It's so damn dark. You have a light shining out that way. But the, this light's hitting your visor and then bouncing right into your eyeballs. So then you're like this, trying to see the highway. See, there's freaking camels crossing the highway. And yeah, the highway's, uh, for me, the worst. Do you listen to music or anything? Or No. Are you allowed to? Yeah, yeah. You can? Yeah. I've tried one time, but dude, like with the AirPods in and like the wind from the from moving... Plus the AirPods, it's like the music doesn't go up loud enough. So you like you hear music, but then you also hear like the yeah, from yeah. the wind, and yeah. you're just like mind boggled. You know, you're trying to listen to the song, so you're like, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I just suck it up. And what are you what are you thinking about when you're on those stages? Like, are you, are you in those moments? Are you just fully in race mode, or are you kind of just off with the fairies in a sense? Uh, it depends. I mean, yeah, you're thinking about the race, but you're also on the highway for four hours. So you're like, fuck, nice coffee sounds good. An extra hour of sleep sounds nice. Yeah. yeah. Home sounds really nice. I got a race today. <laughs> <laughs> How's today going to go? Who's starting behind me? Who's in front of me? Yeah. You start thinking of everything, dude. Yeah. What am I gonna eat when I get back today? <laughs> <laughs> and does it does that quiet down when you're in race mode? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Once once like the light goes green and you're racing, you're just all that's out the window. All your your bullshit thinking, you're just like, you know, tunnel vision, road book, navigation. Then you get back to the liaison. Oh, I'm so fucking hungry. What am I gonna, <laughs> what am I gonna eat when I get back? And then it starts back up yeah. again. Yeah. Man, what time is it at home? Ah, oh, they're sleeping. <laughs> That's fucking so good. Yeah. Did you did you play any other sports when you were a kid? Like just given your build and that, or was it just all BMX? Uh, I played like dude two years of baseball. Played football for like four years. Yeah. But I wasn't into it. Just what it was like the team thing that you weren't that into, or I don't know if it was a team thing that I wasn't into, or uh, the coaches trying to be like big bad bullies are my parents want me to do shit i didn't want to do or yeah i don't know what it was i just you know like the team thing's cool because you know it's a team so everyone has to work together and if no if everyone doesn't work together nothing's gonna happen right you know and that's what's cool about a team sport but also what's cool about like solo is everything's on yourself Mm. and if like you mess up it's not on the team. You can't blame anyone else but yourself. So, you know, it's both are really cool in their own aspects, but I just rather, you know, I don't know, do things myself and I can only blame myself. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that motorsports kind of has a pretty cool element of it's a solo sport and it's all on you, but there, there is like a pretty big team involvement. So you almost get the best of both worlds in a sense, especially like, preparation and in the bivouac and things like that like you are relying on so many people but like the actual task at hand kind of does come down to just your own effort exactly it's it's a perfect mix between both worlds because yeah you have a team you have a team like you're not sharing the bike yeah you're riding your own bike but yeah you have a mechanic and you have like a helper and assistant but when it comes down to actually racing and your time then it comes down to you and you only so, like you said, it's it's a perfect mix for both worlds because you have both. So, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I like it like this. And just, like, ball sports for me, I was never, like, good at them anyways. So, mm. it's just something I'd never pursued. Yeah, I feel like just, yeah, your build, though, and, like, just the, the mindset. Like, you probably would have been a bit of a badass and won a, like, football or whatever. That... I was not trying. Yeah, no, no <laughs> interest in that. I mean they'd make a lot more money for sure but i don't know i just i enjoy like the adventure part of life yeah you know and and what i do right now in my career it allows me to do almost anything i want like within reason but uh i'm lucky i get to travel the world and ride motorcycles on all these different continents and different countries and i think that's pretty amazing and actually this year uh, i've never been to australia so i'm going to australia with cameron Steele to go ride around sick yeah when's that june 
13th. Oh, okay. We I'll, fly. I'll be back home then, actually. Yeah, we fly June 13th from here, and then I think the ride starts like on the 16th. What? So what ride are you going to do? Just, I don't even, dude, I don't know. Just Damon A, just good. Just going to show up with a gear bag, dude. Adventure, I love yeah. that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't even know where, where we're flying into. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a six-day ride. I love that. I wonder. I wonder where he's going. We're for sure gonna go probably to what you said, like the more northern part. Or oh, dude, I hope you're doing that ride. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I would assume we're gonna go to like the most epic places. Yeah. So that'll be sick. If yeah. you if you do Cape York, it'd be so so much fun for you. Yeah. Like just awesome single trail mixed with fire roads, mixed with like rocky shit, just like and so remote you won't see fuck all people like everything is just basic like depending what about on kangaroos ha- oh yeah dude uh that's a, what i want to see <laughs> they're everywhere a guy actually died the day after we uh, the day after we got to the top a dude basically swerved like to avoid a kangaroo ended up going off hitting a tree died the same riding to the tip the same really? yeah the day after we were there yeah damn so they're definitely there <laughs> fucking gnarly but and it's just like crazy crazy remote man there was another guy i um i went fully over the bars i'll actually i'll show you the video <laughs> after there was like a single track kind of it, it's basically just like a logging track like through the through the scrub and uh a lot of the four-wheel drive guys the in like the wet season you can't get up there so the trees will start to grow so then the first guys come through and the, they'll do their four wheel drive track so they'll get a chainsaw out and they'll just cut the stumps off basically low enough so that the car can drive over them but that's not good for bikes <laughs> when you're standing up no yeah so i've went through uh i'm going through one of these roads there's like a little dry creek bed and the the road and the creek bed same color like basically look the same so i'm like rrr, 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 rrr. and i see like the you go down into the creek bed and i was like oh fuck yeah a little jump out of here so i like just jumped and i've gone oh no and the the road went hard left and i basically jumped straight into this creek bed and it was probably like a four foot just straight <laughs> drop dude and i'm just going bang over the handlebars <laughs> and uh like jack my wrist up a bit hit my head and uh get back on the bike because you don't have a choice yeah like there's no you're out there yeah you're out there you can't you walk home push your bike whatever and uh so this was on the i think day two of our trip so i've had a big whack on my head hurt me wrist i'm like all right that's probably a scaphoid but fuck what do you do <laughs> we're out here got got back up got gone i went probably another i think i either got a flat tire before that or right after it so then we had to fix a flat and then i get up a ways and my brother's bike fully shit itself oh so he 80 k's him and my buddy franco franco dragged him out of the scrub for 80 k's <laughs> on the uh, because his bike detonated and then i've gone probably another 40 k's past that and then hit one of those stumps and had a fucking huge one dude <laughs> going over the bar I, squ- I flattened a red bull tin like from going over the bars laying on my back but anyway so we ended up that was a massive massive day it took took maddie and frank like i think six six or seven hours to get out of the out of the scrub and uh and then a dude same same deal a guy that was right behind us crashed like pretty much where i was broke his femur and his hip and had to get they they tried to land a heli where he was but the scrub was so thick that he couldn't land the heli so they had to fucking four wheel drive this poor bastard out with oh, a just broken hip pain. and a broken oh. femur so yeah it's like it's the most epic riding and i'm not really selling it to you right now but it's like <laughs> it's just an it's a gnarly remote fucking epic place i'm looking forward to it i've never been there and let alone i get to go there and ride moto so looking forward to that i mean that's that's set in stone for me so i think that's like the next big trip yeah that would be awesome dude and yeah. you've never been to oz no sick yeah <laughs> you're gonna love it yeah you? it'll be i'll be there for like probably two weeks yeah have you got any other plans when you're there or just gonna get on that ride just gonna get on a ride and probably cruise around after and i don't know 
Check it out. Yeah. Hit you up. Hit up Toby. Well, yeah. Well, I'll, man, I'll be I'll be around. Perfect. Definitely. Be, that's the best time to do that ride, too, because it's like winter, because normally it gets super hot up there. Okay, perfect. What uh, What other countries have you been to that you've really enjoyed? Uh, I've been everywhere, dude. I mean, Japan was super sick. How good is Japan? Dude. Yeah. Japan is really nice. Like the food, the sushi. <laughs> game changer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, like. Did port- you ride over there or was it like a Honda thing? Honda thing. Yeah. 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 I was there for like four days. Was it after you won the first one? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe they'll fly me back. Go check it out again. Yeah. But, uh, I've been, dude, I've been all over, um, mostly for racing, you know, not, not vacation, but. I get to go there and ride dirt bikes and, you know, check new areas out. And I, you know, it's, I'm really grateful for that. And it's nice. And it, I feel like, a, I mean, there's a crazy stat about Americans not even owning passports, you know, like a, there's, yeah. there's so much stuff here that people don't really leave. Like, but I think when you, a lot of Americans do leave, they're like, holy shit, it's so different. And there's like actually so much out there to see. It's, com- yeah. It's it, like, we have it so easy here. And I think like you said, the people that don't have the passports, they're like, oh yeah, like whatever, it's not that easy. I'm like, dude, you should travel the world and realize like everything that we need is at our fingertips. Yeah. Or on the corner. Yeah. Dude, these other countries like, okay, like Saudi, Dubai, yeah, they have like the big cities, but they're still like those nomads that are in the middle of nowhere, dude. Just literally walking around the desert with camels. Yeah. I'm like, that fucking guy ain't got a water jug on him, dude. How's he getting water, you know? And he ain't stealing it from the camel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, like South America, I mean, every every country has like something, you know, a nice city to it and around it. But obviously where we race, we're more remote and like these small villages. And it's like, dude, you go to these small villages and, I mean, they, they don't even have a freaking grocery store. So... They got to drive six hours. Yeah. What if they forget something, you know, like that sucks. And here, I mean, we, we complain cause there's traffic and yeah, it's like, dude, the grocery store is freaking three minutes away. Oh, it takes you six today to get there. Big deal. Like the people in freaking Morocco, they have to drive like a full day trip just to go get some pasta. Mm. Like it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you like a really good perspective when you travel that, like how hard people have got it, you know? Yeah. Like we think we have it hard, but it's like the exact opposite. Yeah. I mean, there's food on every freaking corner here. Out, you know, in other countries, there's we, they don't have that. Yeah. I've never been to Australia, but I would imagine you guys don't have freaking McDonald's in and out and just pizza parlors on every corner, every hundred meters. It's not as bad. I mean, Australia is pretty close to America in like the in the big cities for sure. But it definitely still has a lot more of, of what you're talking about, you know. It's like a lot less than America. Like America oh, is yeah. so bad. There's fast food, dude. Like there's a fast food joint next to a fast food joint next to a restaurant next to a fast food joint. You know, there's we're outnumbered by fast food joints instead of grocery stores. You know, it's crazy. Where in other countries, it's a exact opposite. Yeah, you have more grocery stores than fast food joints. Like the only fast food joint I think I've ever seen is a McDonald's, mm. and even that is so like spread out it's yeah you no know, mcdonald dude got one on every corner here in america yeah and a starbucks yeah yeah that's so true i you was want a uh, good coffee in some other country dude you got a freaking oh you gotta hustle that shit yeah <laughs> yeah yeah dude it ain't easy uh dude, as soon as i got to dubai i just bought a gravel coffee machine for myself i'm a big big morning coffee guy got oh, the I bravo got coffee machine the, which one? What one did you say? Breville. Breville. Yeah. That's like the, the legit one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, uh, my teammate Adrian has this one. Oh, yeah, the little single, like the... Yeah, dude. Grind it up, tamp it down. Yeah, yeah, that's the shit. Uh, are you a big, you big coffee guy, though? Yeah, but I don't... I have an It's just like a heart rate monitor. You just yeah. Fucking simplest coffee machine they make. That's what you got. Yeah, I got like... I have an espresso machine, then I have like a French press, but at the end of the day, it's like just too hard, so I just buy like a dark roast coffee i have a keurig but i make a small cup and then i just make my own cappuccino out of that with a freaking thing 
<laughs> but no, the espresso machine is nice. I'll break it out once in a while, but it's just, dude, it's a lot of work for a little coffee. What I think I, I need is like, dude, have you seen those, those little Nespresso? Oh, they're good. Like with the little, yeah, the little pods, dude, for a quick shot, dude, that is the best machine. You but you should probably buy yourself something now. You've just won Dakar. You got a bonus coming. Why don't you buy it? There's really good like Brevels that are auto, so you don't have to fully fuck with it. Maybe you should lash out. Maybe I should check it out. Maybe you should. I think you should. You should give yourself something out of this win. But the Nespresso one, I could take it in my truck when I go camping and plug that thing into the back too. That is true. Yeah, yeah, it's that fairly is true. easy and they're cheap. Yeah, I'm cheap. <laughs> I have a nice vehicle, dude, but I, I like skimp out on everything else. Yeah. Like I don't buy clothes. Well, I mean, sponsors like give more than enough clothes, but dude, I run, I run my shit till it can't till the it. wheels fall off. Yeah. Like dude, the grocery store. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. How much money is this fucking <laughs> steak and salad? <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, it's unbelievable. But no, I, I definitely, I'm going to look into the Nespresso. It's like, I think like 120 bucks. Yeah, yeah, you got that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's and a, I could bring it with me in the truck. That's a nice little Dakar bonus. Yeah, because you got the two, the, you got the, like the one twenty volt in the truck, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, game changer, dude. Yeah, easy money, dude. Put a little, put it in a little Pelican case or something, oh, so yeah. it don't get damaged, dude. Dialed in. Trial, trial coffee. How good is a trial coffee? Exactly. I think that's bitching. <laughs> Pull over, dude. Like <laughs> yeah. four minutes, done. Oh yeah. And then now you're sparked up on coffee, <laughs> ready to just send for another four hundred k's. Exactly. I love it. I was uh, I was watching a doco the other day just to go back to that whole America thing. Like, it, there was uh, a guy who was. Have you ever seen Channel Five News? Yeah, Andrew, I watch it every morning, dude. You you do, Andrew Callahan. Yeah. So did you have you watched the uh, his special on like the illegal immigrants yet? I don't think so, dude. So so fucking gnarly. Eh? Like it just when you were talking before, it kind of just like made me think of that. Like. America has uh, like the view on immigration that they have, but it's like from people that haven't been to other countries that like haven't seen legit poverty. And it was so like heartbreaking in a sense to just see all of these. He's like interviewing these people speaking in Spanish as they're like, they've literally hopped the border wall and they've like gone through the fences and it's like a mom with four kids. And oh. like the way they speak about America is like, this is the place where you can come and make your dreams happen. This is the place that's for, and it's just like, fuck, it's so heavy when you, when you've been to those places, you see the poverty and then you see like the lengths that people will go to, to like literally walk to America and like yeah. the amount of people that are, that die in the desert every day making that crossing and shit. Like when you talk about like how good America is and like people don't understand how good they've got it, like, there's literally people dying walking here. So we get here. That's yeah. how good it is. And it's like that perspective is lost on people sometimes. Yeah. They don't realize what I mean, you don't realize what you have until it's gone, right? Yeah, or if you've never seen anything else. Yeah. Like if you've never experienced another place, like if you go to a place like Vietnam, you know, like we've ridden motorcycles across Vietnam and you've got your cities and it's the same as every other city. But you get out into the hills and like we'd see kids like three, four year old kids that had never seen a white person. <laughs> they're just like they're, they're staring at you like you're ripping out, bro, looking at you like you're a fucking alien. Yeah. And they've never even seen a, a white person. You yeah, know, what are you? <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, there's a lot of hidden places, hidden gems in the world and you know, as you said, they, they've never seen something like that. And in the rallies is the same thing. You know, when we're ripping through the desert, we get to some camp. I wouldn't even call it a village. It's a camp. And they're just like, yeah, like, what are you? Yeah. And then like the kids are like throwing rocks at you and you're like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Like, yeah, they, but they don't know. They've never seen it. Yeah. They're probably scared for their life. There's, there's a dude riding something they've never seen dressed up in all this gear they probably think is like, like a some... stormtrooper yeah yeah they don't know dude and then when all these cars come through dude they never seen those those cars you know they look futuristic 
Well, all they got is a moped and a bicycle, dude. Like, we come blitzing through their camp, and they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah. Who are – am I alive? <laughs> like, yeah, it's wild out there. Yeah. Dude, you know the the second last stage of the Desert Challenge last year? We were, like, right on that Saudi border. And did you – you know where, like, you – do you remember that stage? Well, I didn't know we were that close to the border. Bro. Like where that, where the, it finished and then you come out and you go left onto the road and then you went back yeah. to the hotel. Dude, me and my brother, we tried to drive to the border and it was maybe like oh, 400 meters from where that you guys turn left and go, go on the road it was like this massive, like do not cross. And then we, we like got up close military truck drove out like, Hey boys, you can't be here and shit. That was so gnarly. Wow, dude. they were on that's, they were in force. That's how close it it was there. So like when you guys are doing the these rallies there, like man, you just would have no idea the kind of stuff that you're actually close to, eh? Yeah, fuck. Yeah, that's sketchy. Yeah, I couldn't well, believe. Well, in Morocco, we're really close to uh, the neighbor country that doesn't like it. Uh, I don't know, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot the name of it, but yeah, we're pretty close to the border there, and that's like a big no no. Yeah. But I thought, like, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think it's, like, not that anything gnarly was going on, but, like, it was just one of those, it was, like, a, I guess, like, a military border, in a sense, to like, where it's, yeah, like... military only. Yeah, it's, like, this is the border of Saudi, and if you ain't military, you're not coming past here. Yeah, you gotta go around. And we're, like, right there. Wow. And those dunes are crazy there, right? The Lewa, those the Lee, Lewa dunes. Lewa dunes. Are they the biggest dunes you've seen, or are they bigger? Peru has some big ass dunes. So Peru's got bigger ones. Yeah, but I mean, Lee was a good desert. They have big dunes. Uh, where we were for the Chrono stage was also big dunes, but uh, I mean, coming down them definitely scary because, like, dude, you're going down this dune that's straight down has like a couple kicks in it, but then you're going down this dune straight down and it's a ninety degree hit right there, but. Dude, I, you can't go slow because, dude, you're going straight <laughs> you, freaking yeah, down yeah, and you're yeah. on the brakes, but you're still just now you're on the brakes, but it's like an avalanche around you that's like sliding with you. But uh, no, the dunes are definitely like to get to get to the top of the valley of the dunes is is difficult. But once you're up there, it's like a plateau of dunes. So you don't think uh, you don't think yeah. you're very high. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Then, but then when you hit the road book, you know couple k's later and then you need to go back down to the desert floor and you're going to the floor and you're like fuck i see a valley way out there but then when you're dropping into this valley dude it's it's like 500 meters that's wild straight eh? down yeah it's full on when you get out into those places and you just see space yeah like and just sand sky and that's it and nothing other to help you yeah and then like yeah you see it on tv and I mean, it looks big on TV, but dude, in person, like if they zoom out on the heli footage then they zoom out and then like the bikes going, that's when you get like the true mm. vision of how big the dunes are. But like, normally it's just like they're zoomed in on you like this, but if they freaking zoom out a little bit and then you see the Valley of dunes and then you see like one little bike, then you're like, wow, big. Yeah. It's pretty incredible, man. Like what you guys get to do away. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's quite a life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, I know you got to get to uh, you got to get to press day. You got to be at what ten ten thirty? Yeah, All press right. day. We should probably do that. Well, well, see how far it is actually. Just see where you're at on the stadium. But um, yeah, man, it's been uh, it's been insanely cool getting to getting to chat. I know I know we've wanted to get this one done for a little bit. So and I I don't want to make you late. Uh, what uh, Angel, Angel Stadium? Angel Stadium, yeah. Angel Stadium. 11 miles? No. Yeah, I told you it was close. Really? Yeah. Grass from Snow. I just need to get there. <laughs> yeah, it's 25 minutes. Oh, we still got a little bit more time. I got to take a leak. Yeah, yeah, go piss then. Oh, or should we wrap this up and get a coffee? Is that what we should do? Okay, you like nice coffee? Let's go get a nice coffee. We'll wrap this up and we'll get a quick coffee. 
Yeah, I only had one coffee this morning. I'm a two cup guy. Me too. <laughs> Let's go and hit it. Anyone you want to thank? Any any messages before we wrap this thing up? No, nah, just yeah. Thank you guys for following along, and like, thank you to everyone that follows my journey. I hope you know it motivates uh, younger athletes, and hopefully, I can see some younger people like get more involved into the rally raid. It's not easy, but don't give up on your dreams. You know, it's life's not guaranteed. So if you can stay focused and work hard, I think you can achieve anything that you set your mind out to do. Yeah. And you're an awesome example of it, dude. And you're just a super humble, super regular <laughs> rad guy to be around. So, uh, yeah, you, you're one of those guys that, that wears winning very well. So I, uh, yeah, wish you good luck on uh, going for three. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, that'd be nice. Three Pete. <laughs> awesome brother. Yeah. Thank you guys. We are excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com, packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.